Good morning, and at this time, will sergeants please start their recordings? According to the PC has begun. According to the cloud is all set. Backup is rolling. Thank you, and Sergeant Hope. Yes. Good morning, and welcome to the New York City Council preliminary budget hearing for the fiscal year 2022. At this time, will all panelists please turn on your videos? I repeat, all panelists, please turn on your videos. Thank you. This hearing is held jointly with the Committee on Housing and Buildings and the Subcommittee on Capital Budget. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at, at testimonycouncil.nyc.gov. I repeat, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Also, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mood. Thank you. Chair, you're ready to begin. Good morning, and thank you all for attending today's virtual hearing on fiscal year 2022 preliminary budget for the Department of Buildings, DOB, and the Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development, HPD. I'm Council Member Robert Cornegie, and I'm the chair of the Council's Committee on Housing and Buildings. Exactly one year ago today, the Council's Committee on Housing and Buildings held its budget hearing on the fiscal 2021 budget. It's hard to express how much has changed since last March and how much the COVID-19 pandemic has upended our lives, livelihoods, routines, and finances. Even more concerning is that these impacts have not been felt equally. In certain communities and neighborhoods are struggling now more than ever. COVID-19 has had a desperate impact on communities of color who are also facing compounded crisis of financial and housing instability. The wave of evictions, that may occur if households do not receive assistance and the wave of foreclosures that may occur if homeowners are not supported makes the fiscal 2022 budget cycle that much more significant. While the road to post-COVID recovery is long, we must use every tool at our disposal to ensure that renters struggling to pay rent and homeowners, especially senior homeowners and homeowners of color are not further crushed and displaced by the pandemic. We'll first hear from the Department of Buildings where we will examine the department's 1.8, 182 million expense budget and 338 million revenue budget, as well as its function as the city agencies responsible for enforcing the New York City construction codes, zoning resolution, and the New York State multiple dwelling law. Specific attention will be paid to DOB, DOB's role in enforcing heightened energy standards, the department's progress related to its construction site safety and training compliance, as well as implementation of the department's self-service online tool, DOB Now. After DOB, we'll hear from the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, where we'll examine the components of HPD's $1 billion expense budget and $6 billion capital budget, along with details and progress related to the, the administration's housing plan, Housing New York. HPD is now past the halfway mark in terms of the production goals under Housing New York with about 178,000 affordable units financed to date over the life of the plan. There's much to celebrate about the level of production, which has exceeded projected targets and production goals, even in fiscal 2020 during a pandemic. But as the city addresses the complex challenges of producing and preserving quality affordable housing, it does so at a point in time when the housing market has been paused, restarted, and reordered. I look forward to further discussing the complexities of these issues with the administration and working with them to ensure a robust plan is in place to address the various vulnerabilities that exist within the reordered housing market. After HPD, we'll hear from members of the public. I'll now turn it over to our committee council to go over some procedural items. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Audrey Sun, counsel to the Committee on Housing and Buildings at New York City Council. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. Please be aware that there could be a delay in muting and unmuting, so please be patient. I will call on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name as I will periodically announce who the next panelist will be. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. Council member questions will be set to three minutes. The hearing will be divided into three sections. 
First, we will hear from the Department of Buildings, followed by council member questions. Second, we will hear from the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, followed by council member questions. And finally, we will hear from members of the public. The first panelist to give testimony will be Melanie LaRocca, Commissioner for the Department of Buildings. She will be joined by Sharon Neal, Deputy Commissioner for Finance and Administration at the Department of Buildings, who will be available for questions. I will now administer the oath. I will call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your right hands. Wait, I'm sorry, um, Committee Council, if I could just acknowledge the presence of my colleagues who are in the room before we begin, uh, starting yes, with the majority, Minority Leader, uh, Steve Matteo, uh, I see Councilmember Farrah Lewis, Councilmember Harold Rosenthal, Councilmember Barry Gredentia, Councilmember Margaret Chin. Um, have I missed anyone? If I have, please acknowledge uh, their presence. This usually happens, unfortunately, with my limited screen. So that, that's who I saw. If anyone else is here, please make sure that you use the raise hand function um, so that we could acknowledge your presence. Thank you. Thanks very much. I will now administer the oath. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner LaRocca? Yes. Deputy Commissioner Neal? Yes. Thank you. You may begin when ready. Good morning, Chair Carnegie and members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. I'm Melanie LaRocca, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Buildings. I'm joined today by Sharon Neal the department's deputy commissioner for finance and administration. We're pleased to be here to discuss the fiscal, fiscal year 2020 preliminary budget and the department's progress in meeting its goals. The last time I testified in person before this committee was exactly one, years, uh, one year ago, as the chair mentioned, just days before we started to feel the unimaginable impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic in New York City. The pandemic quickly impacted the construction industry and the work we do at the department. While our work to enforce the laws and regulations that govern the more than 1 million buildings and nearly 40,000 active construction sites under our jurisdiction continued throughout the pandemic. We also began to protect New Yorkers in new ways. We are now working to ensure that construction sites and other businesses are abiding by guidelines to protect against the spread of COVID-19. I am very proud of the work our staff has been doing throughout this pandemic and commend them for their hard work. The department is committed to doing its part to ensure the city recovers from this pandemic and we look forward to finding opportunities to partner with this committee and council to accomplish that very important goal. Turning now to the department's budget, the fiscal year 2020 preliminary budget allocates approximately 182 million in expense funds to the department. Of this funding, approximately 152 is for personnel services, which supports 1,794 positions, and nearly 30 million is for OTPS services, which primarily supports contractual services, equipment, and supplies. The department's budget was reduced by 12.8 million as part of the citywide savings program, which tasks agencies with implementing savings initiatives. Reductions in PS services totaling approximately 8 million were achieved by reducing headcount and reducing overtime spending. Reductions in OTPS totaling 4.8 million were achieved by delaying discretionary contract services, reducing vehicle purchases, and reducing telecommunication wireless services. I would like to now highlight some of the department's work over the past year. The department continues to make tremendous progress in key areas, including to facilitate development in an efficient manner, to improve safety at construction sites, to keep tenants safe, and to reduce emissions from buildings, all while continuing to improve the services we offer to our customers and members of the public. In fiscal year 2020, nearly 104,000 construction jobs were filed with the department and we issued approximately 148,000 initial and renewal construction permits combined. For the first time ever, more construction jobs were filed in DOB now than in the building information system. 
which demonstrates the progress we're making to replace a three decade old mainframe system. DOB now will allow our customers to conduct all their business with the department online, which will lead to greater efficiency and more transparency by allowing owners, design professionals, and contractors to determine exactly where construction project is in the approval process. We are reviewing plans for new buildings, major renovation, and minor re renovations expeditiously. We are completing our initial plan review for new buildings and major alterations in five days and for minor renovations in a little over two days. Our goal is to continue to promptly complete our initial plan reviews and to ensure that customers know what to expect when their plans are being reviewed by continuing to train our plan examiners and by developing plan exam guidelines for a wide variety of projects which will help ensure that plan review is efficient and consistent. The wait times between a development inspection request and an inspection decreased across the board. The wait time for a general construction inspection was two days and was under three days for an electrical or plumbing inspection. This progress on development inspection service levels can be attributed to the efficiencies gained from DOB Now inspections which allows for all types of development inspections to be scheduled online. This makes it easier for our customers to schedule inspection appointments, offers more precise inspection scheduling and improves inspection tracking. To provide even more transparency to our customers, we launched our customer service dashboard last year. This new tool allows the public to view a variety of metrics in real time helping them understand exactly what to expect when starting a construction project. The customer service dashboard calculates average timelines for plan reviews by types, the number of appointments to plan approval, inspection request, and general customer service. We continue to respond to complaints from members of the public faster than ever before. We are responding to the most serious complaints, priority A complaints, which are those complaints that relate to conditions that may present an immediate threat to the public within hours. We are responding to priority B complaints which capture violating conditions that if occurring while, not seri while serious, do not present an immediate threat to the public within 12 days. As a result of responding to these complaints and our proactive inspections concerning construction safety and tenant protection, we issued over 80,000 oath summonses last year. With this committee's partnership, the department is also continuing our efforts to maintain the city's construction codes. Code revision is truly a collaborative effort between our staff and the hundreds of industry stakeholders who volunteered their time to ensure our construction codes reflect advancements in technology, as well as the latest standards for life safety. Together, we've already updated the city's plumbing codes and worked together to implement the most stringent energy code in our system in our history. We are in the process of updating the balance of the construction codes, the electrical code, and for the first time, developing an existing building code, which will specifically address construction projects in an existing building. We look very forward to our partnering with this committee to continue to strengthen these codes and look forward to a robust committee hearing. Construction safety continues to be a focus of the department. In 2019, for the first time in nearly a decade, construction-related injuries decreased. Last year, we saw another decrease in construction-related injuries with 502 construction-related injuries in 2020, down 34% from the 761 construction-related injuries in 2018. This decrease in injuries comes after the launch of our Construction Safety Compliance Unit in 2018, which is dedicated to conducting proactive unannounced inspections of large construction sites. To date, the CSC unit has conducted over 50,000 proactive inspections at over 22,000 unique construction sites. The decrease in injuries also coincides with the implementation of Local Law 196, of 2017. As of March 1st, just this past Monday, workers at large construction sites are required to have 40 hours of safety training and supervisors at those sites are required to have 62 hours of safety training, including very critically fall prevention, fall prevention training, 
which has the potential to save lives. Since the enactment of this law, we have conducted extensive outreach to the construction industry, including directly to workers who are impacted. I am pleased to report that our approved course providers have issued over 121,000 site safety training cards and many thousands of OSHA 30 cards to workers, which means that workers are in fact receiving the safety training required by this law. Last year, we held our first ever virtual construction industry conference, which focused on safety, innovation, and sustainability. And for the first time, our annual industry conference included sessions dedicated to worker safety, which highlighted Local Law 196 and the importance of receiving site safety training. Last week, last month, pardon me, we launched a seven week facade and scaffold safety, safety blitz. This campaign includes direct educational outreach to construction workers, as well as industry professionals on scaffold safety and uh, construction sweeps on construction on facade work across uh, the five boroughs. As part of this effort, we've also issued our first worker alert, which provides practical situational safety information and straightforward guidance for those workers performing facade work. We look uh, forward to working with this committee to further improve construction safety and to further drive down construction related injuries and fatalities. There is absolutely no excuse for a worker not going home to their family at the end of their shift. And I firmly believe that working together with this committee, we can continue to prevent unnecessary injuries and fatalities. For example, we know that we can do more to hold bad actors accountable for actions that result in serious injury, death, or property damage, and to implement practices that are proven to work to improve safety at more construction sites, including requiring more site safety supervision. This department continues its critical work to protect tenants. We're committed to providing our Office of the Tenant Advocate with the tools it needs to succeed. OTA serves as a resource to help tenants understand the laws that govern construction, to investigate complaints of construction as harassment, and acts as our liaison to tenants with any department-related issues. Our OTA works closely with other units dedicated to tenant protection, including our Office of Building Marshals, which conducts proactive inspections to ensure that contractors are complying with tenant protection plans, as well as responds to tenant harassment complaints, and our Real-Time Enforcement Unit, which responds to work without a permit complaints from tenants expeditiously. Working in tandem, these units provide our tenants with the resources they need to navigate construction in their homes and respond to any issue they may have. The department is also prepared to fulfill its obligation to address greenhouse gas emissions from coming from buildings. We are well positioned with the largest energy team anywhere in the country to support the city's goal of achieving carbon neutrality. In addition to enforcing the energy code, existing, uh, enforcing existing laws that require certain buildings to report their energy and water use and to perform retro commissioning, we're also implementing the Climate Mobilization Act. As you know, the Climate Mobilization Act requires all new buildings and existing buildings undergoing certain major roof renovations to install a solar photovoltaic system, a green roof system, or a combination of the two, and regulates greenhouse gas emissions from large buildings starting in 2024. Last year, buildings were also required to start posting energy grades which ensures that buildings are held accountable for their performances uh, and makes their building energy efficiency transparent to the public. We recognize the significant impact that our work can have on the public, whether they are planning a construction project, attempting to resolve a violation, or wanting to find out more about construction work in their community. As such, we will continue making our work accessible to the public by providing them with resources they can understand and use like our customer service dashboard and our real time map of after hour construction work, which allows the public to determine whether after hour construction in their neighborhood is occurring with proper permits. 
We will also continue conducting outreach directly to members of the public impacted by our work, uh, which includes sending letters to property owners when their neighbor is conducting construction work so that they're aware of the work and any disruptions it may cause. Thank you very much, as always, for the opportunity to testify before you. I look forward to continuing our work together to help improve this department for the benefit of all New Yorkers. And I would certainly welcome any questions you may have. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner, for that testimony. Um, I was going to thank you for the most recent incidences and your uh, very swift attention uh, to them on construction sites. Uh, we were on the phone on a, a few occasions um, trying to mitigate some of this, and I really appreciate and respect your keeping um, this committee in the loop. Thank um, you, Chair. Uh, when, when, when things aren't going, you know, famously, still keeping us in the loop about what's happening uh, as it relates to site safety. Safety, that's, that's important to me. So thank you for that. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so I have a, I'm going to start with a few questions and then let my colleagues uh, and the co-chair uh, ask their questions and then I'll return to my questions. I won't monopolize the time. I know people have other things on their schedule. So I'll just begin by um, uh, starting with Local Law 97 established the Office of Building and Energy Emissions Performance within the Department of Buildings as of the, as the Greater Climate Mobilization Act, as you mentioned. However, when viewing the department's budget documents, funding and headcount for the office remains a little bit unclear. Um, as a fiscal 2022 preliminary plan, could you please describe the amount of funding, both PS and OTPS, as well as the associated headcount allocated to the Office of Building, Energy and Emissions Performance? Absolutely, thank you, Chair. As, you, as I mentioned in, in uh, my testimony, obviously the work to establish um, uh, the Office of Building Energy and Emission Performance as required by Local Law 97 and, and fundamentally the work that is required of Local Law 97 is incredibly important. Uh, that's why we've put this unit under our Chief Sustainability Officer, Gina Bro Bokra, who many of you um, uh, on the committee have seen her work, uh, which is why we've allocated six positions to this. And we know that as our work continues to implement Local Law 97, um, that universe will continue to grow with it. So we've allocated six positions uh, for this work and we'll continue to grow that um, as the work continues to move along, um, uh, getting closer to the milestones set forth in the law. So um, uh, staying right there for a second, you know, last year uh, before the pandemic, we had a, a big hearing on the use of drones for efficiency and for um, energy efficiency in particular. Um, and, and, you know, and my bill, which called for a study of drone use in that way, it seems like this office would be a perfect place uh, for that to happen. Um, are there any thoughts and ideas as it relates to uh, energy efficiency um, with the use of drones? Because um, uh, I, I, would, I would imagine that now that this office exists, that's where that would be parked. And that's where the study would take place. I'm just curious, is, is, is that where, where it's going to take place? And can we count on um, working together to get maximum efficiency uh, with the use of drones and other, and other technologies uh, sure. that are forward thinking? Yeah, I mean, so uh, thank you for the question on drones. We're obviously working uh, towards uh, being in a position to have the report finalized as the law prescribes toward the end of the year. And we will meet that deadline. In part of our review of drones, we are um, obviously talking with our colleagues at various different agencies um, about what their uh, interest and uh, uh, experience with drone technology has been. We are certainly talking with um, members of the external community, including some larger firms who have expressed an interest, A, and B, um, the technology um, that they believe would be beneficial to us um, as we look about potentials for the use of drone. Um, you know, having a drone is one thing, right? That is the apparatus that flies. The technology in the drone is really the crux of what we're trying to understand. I think anybody can put a, put a device up and fly it around, but if you're not getting the type of um, video quality um, that we would need to look at 
look deeper in areas like facades, which is originally how we had started talking about this, but also in bringing it back to 97, there are certain technology that one, one could use, one could reasonably expect could be helpful in understanding um, whether a building is sufficiently insulated, whether we see a significant amount of heat penetrating out of the building. Um, certainly those things would be very um, important to understanding the state of our building. So yes, I definitely could see um, uh, benefit uh, to a wide variety of the work we do here, as well as potentially benefit to owners. Um, so we'll continue to go down that path. We'll make sure that we're looking at it um, in the context of also um, our work around sustainability. So, so uh, thank you for that. I, I, I agree with you. I, I think that uh, my limited knowledge tells me that I, I believe it's called thermal thermal imagery. Correct. Drones are able to use to to um, quantify escaping energy from buildings. And I just could see that as the wave of the future. I'm just hoping that with this new office, we can work together. So thank you for your answer. Thank on you. That. I mean, you know, this wasn't about drones and I slid that in. So thank you for uh, entertaining me. Right, because uh, so me, me and Ben an Kalos, absolutely fair point, Chair. An yeah. absolutely fair point. Ben Kalos and I, who are self-professed nerds, uh, <laughs> we, we talk about this all all day, right? So, but thank you for taking time out to just, you know, it just seems like it would be synonymous with this new department to begin those studies there. Uh, so I'll move on. You've already you've already answered the question of of uh, where the office resides and the, the headcount, which I appreciate. Has the office begun the process of establishing protocols for assessing annual energy use in yes. buildings Is that you have? Yes, we have. So um, uh, the team has, yes, done this already, begun this work. We've established the advisory board um, as laid out in Local Law 97. We've also um, established a number of working groups as part of that process. So we've had nearly 50 advisory board and working group meetings uh, in calendar year 2020. And these will continue um, in this calendar year on a weekly basis. Um, we've also begun the work around creating rules uh, that are required by the law to be in place. And so um, uh, that work is progressing. Uh, you mentioned that as it related to drones, the collaboration with other city agencies I'm wondering, has the office begun the collaboration with other city agencies in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions within governmental operations? Absolutely. I think uh, I can think of probably no instance in our work uh, at the department where we have committees and collaborative processes in place where we don't include our partners in the city um, since we are such a fundamental aspect of other uh, uh, agencies' work. Um, it's pretty uh, natural to us. And so I extend that to the work around Local Law 97. We've involved uh, uh, our partners at DCAS, um, Mayor's Office of Sustainability, HPD, NYCHA, uh, Health and Hospitals, Department of Finance, School Construction Authority, among others. So um, uh, our partners in the city are very much uh, embedded in the work of the advisory boards, advisory board, pardon me, as well as the working groups. Thank you. So DOB now implementation, the department recently reached another milestone as we spoke about and as you said in your testimony, uh, uh, DOB now phase in, where, where DOB now build will accept plan submissions from new building construction as well as major alterations that alter a building certificate of occupancy. The fiscal 2022 preliminary plan includes 8.6 million for the DOB now, DOB now project in fiscal 2022, a decrease of 1.2 million from fiscal year 2021 adopted budget. Additionally, funding for DOB now decreases to 1.3 million in the out years. Is the decrease in projected funding for DOB now a signal that the department is over the hump in terms of projects implementation? Yeah, I, I would say we've made an incredible amount of progress. I mentioned in the testimony that we're seeing the majority of the filings now start moving into DOB now versus biz, and I think you know, for the last 30 some odd years, people have been in the mindset of biz. We're obviously marching fast out of that mindset into a much more transparent uh, tool. And on the transparency side, I just wanna stress the importance. It's not just transparency for um, the Department of Buildings, although certainly we, we will be getting far greater um, data 
from DOB now than we were ever able to get on um, precisely what is happening. Um, but it's also transparency for our, our customers in plan review. So those are uh, registered design professionals. Um, but the important part there to me uh, among the many Im improvements that DOB now will allow us is that we're finally getting the kind of transparency um, that is so important for the ultimate customer, which is the person paying the bill. Um, and so having the ability for that person, right? You, me, or anybody else who is hiring a contractor, who's hiring um, a registered design professional to uh, file work with the department is, you know, fundamentally new to us. So I think that level of transparency is awesome. Um, but to your actual question, yes, we've made tremendous progress. We have more to do, you know, build, uh, DOB now has four main components, build, inspections, licensing, and safety. Um, in that, we've made great progress. We had a launch just um, this past Monday, which coincided with um, uh, the final milestone of Local Law 196, where we launched uh, more work types on build. So now we have 23 out of the 33 work types that are um, uh, now fully available on build. We have three compliance filings um, uh, in our safety portal. Um, we have two uh, license types uh, already in licensing with one more coming this year. And on inspections, as I mentioned, um, all of our development inspections are now uh, utilizing uh, DOB now. About 60% of our enforcement universe is in that platform. And we'll continue working on expanding what's available in DOB now um, uh, up until 2023, where we expect to be finishing. So I would not say we are over the hump. We have, we've done a lot of work and we have a lot more to do. Um, but I think we're finally at that point where we're starting to see the scales tip. So you, you partially answered my next question um, in terms of timeline. Is there a more in-depth, in-depth, detailed timeline that you can give the committee? Um, you know, let me, I don't have those right now, but let me come back to you with that level of granularity, I would say one piece is, you know, as we expand the universe, obviously, um, you know, migrating from a 30 year old system, which has established a very specific mindset for all of our different users, takes a whole lot of work. So we'll get you more detail on, on our expected um, releases, uh, acknowledging uh, upfront with the committee that things will evolve um, as the work to transition away from a very paper manual based system into a system that is exactly the same for everybody um, does prove to take a lot of time. So I, I wanna take this opportunity to um, welcome uh, Chair Rosenthal, right? And, and, and Chair Rosenthal, they call this baptism by fire, right? Because you, you, you're, you're coming on in your subcommittee role right at the budget time, right? So, you, you, you know, there's, there's, there's not much of a learning curve, but if you had, if you had the next round of questions, um, I'd love thank to have that. Thank you so much, Chair Carnegie. You stole all my thunder, so I just- uh, <laughs> Sure, I did. I know, I, anybody who knows Helen Rosenthal knows that she doesn't have a, a, a lack nothing. of question. I really just wanted to ask um, about the success of the Office of the Tenant Advocate and um, hear about what kind of additional funding was added for their unit. There are very many things I love about the Department of Buildings. I will start there. Um, some of the things that I really love a lot uh, at DOB, um, uh, is the work that OTA does. Uh, you know, Sarah Desmond is our OTA, uh, is our OTA. Um, she is tremendous. Um, that is, putting her there in that position was a uh, affirmation of our commitment to tenants um, and truly believing that um, there is a very strong intersect between the work the department does and tenants. Um, and tenants' rights to be in their home peacefully and a, an acknowledgement that we have a very 
critical role to play in protecting homes. So we have lots of hats. We uh, unabashedly love development here. That is our business. We are in the business of development. And I say that very loosely because it's not just about building new homes. It's about maintaining property that exists um, and improving it. So we see development as a very important tool for the city, but um, we cannot be blind to the fact that um, Buildings exist as, in some instances, homes to people. And sometimes people rent and sometimes people own and why we care is, uh, uh, you know, beyond me, but we don't anymore. Um, homes are where people live and that's our business as well. So uh, I could wax poetically uh, all day, every day about tenant um, rights, about worker rights. Um, uh, so I look forward to doing that, but specifically to what OTA has been up to, um, we've given them, uh, certainly, um, they have resources. We're obviously always looking at ways to strengthen their work and uh, expand their scope uh, in this department. So we'll keep looking at ways to further uh, those two things. Uh, bigger and better tenant advocate is helpful to this agency. Um, uh, but helpful to know also that people are now starting to catch on. So we've seen growth in the OTA's work in the last calendar year. In 2020, we've seen um, the amount of inquiries that they've received um, going up. There are uh, about 2,500 or so inquiries they got uh, in 2020, which was growth from the previous year and where they were about 1,700 or so. Um, so that to me is awesome. Right? We want them to be busier, so I look forward to that number growing. And obviously, should that happen, we'll continue to provide it, uh, OTA the resources we think it needs. Right. Um, and plus, I think having it embedded in enforcement was the right place for it. Uh, it allows Sarah and her team of liaisons to work seamlessly with our um, OBM folks um, to make sure that all parts of the universe are seeing the same thing. So um, that's terrific. Um, part of my question was, um, was there an increase in funding for that unit between FY 21 and 22? Um, Sharon will help me, but no, we have a baseline budget here of 528,000 for this office. So uh, that's where OTA stands. And again, we'll continue to evaluate its workload and, um, uh, and our belief that it should have a bigger footprint in this department and we'll continue to work with our partners to uh, see how we can advance that. Awesome. Were all 2,500 um, uh, calls, you know, outreaches from my office or were they from all over the place? I would love to give you credit for all of that, uh, <laughs> but I cannot. I undoubtedly believe there were some others, but you are certainly near and dear to our, our heart. Well, I, I mean, say that half jokingly, but half, you know, maybe we have to do a better job at letting people know that this office exists and what it does to help people. So I'm wondering, you know, when it first started, there was a terrific education campaign and we had flyers to pass out, but perhaps it would be worth having a marketing campaign to um, the tenant advocacy organizations um, who would use this service and to council member and elected offices. And I'm wondering if that's possible. That's a fantastic suggestion. I see no reason why we can't do that. You're very kind. Um, you know, the goal is to really get that number way up because I think the power of that office is significant. And similarly, last question, have you been able to measure its success in some way? Like, have you found a way to measure it? I'm not quite sure what it is, but. Yeah, I mean, part of that is, um, Obviously, OTA releases a quarterly report, uh, uh, which we'll continue to do, which does track um, our success. Um, so I think on the, on the pure numbers, we are successful, right? We, uh, we are able to meet our metrics with respect to enforcement actions, with respect to uh, inspection. So that is tremendous. I think 
the proof of seeing people, particularly in a pandemic, uh, increase the utilization of OTA is really a good sign, um, right? We fundamentally changed how we provide service in, um, in the department during the pandemic. And yet, even with that, we've seen a growth of use for OTA. So that's not quite as scientific as you know whether we've met our metrics on inspections, but to me, that's a very important sign. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much. And um, you know, you're just such a breath of fresh air for this department. Um, it's been a pleasure working with you. So thank you very much. Back thank to you, Chair Lindy. Thank you. Before we go to uh, my colleagues and colleagues' question, I do want to acknowledge the presence of uh, Councilmember Marjona and Councilmember Carlina Rivera. General Counsel, can you uh, uh, call the stack? Yes. Uh, thank you. We will now take questions from Councilmember Chin. If any other council members have questions for the Dep Department of Buildings, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in turn. Councilmember Chin. Thank I'm you. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning. Thank you to the chair. And it's great to see you, Commissioner. Um, I echo my colleague, Councilmember Rosenthal. It's great to have strong woman leadership with the Department of Building. Really makes uh, a big difference. And I just want to follow up on a question about the um, Office of Tenant Advocacy. I think that is um, really such a great addition to the Department of Building. I remember years ago, you know, we were um, pushing for this because there was all this construction uh, harassment that was going on uh, with lead, uh, dust, and all these renovations um, that was causing a lot of problems uh, for tenant. And even right now, I have a building in my district uh, that is getting a lot of uh, vibration and feeling earthquake because it's a construction uh, of a, a new building next door. And you know we reach out to um, DOB and DEP and everybody's uh, involved in it. And I think it's really, uh, we need to publicize this unit um, more because even my staff don't really realize that there is a special unit in DOB that can really help uh, focus on this issue and, and that's great. And so I wanna make sure that we have resources for that. Uh, my other question is scaffolding. Like how is DOB tracking to make sure that when a scaffold goes up, that the work is done timely and it comes back down because they're causing a lot of issue, not just in my district, but other district. Uh, I mean, that's where, where we have problem with homeless and garbage. Uh, it's because these scaffold stays up for years. Uh, and so I wanted to, to see is how DOB be dealing with that particular issue. And then my third question um, is on language access to make sure that, um, that you have the staff, you know, that will be able to help, you know, immigrant population, people who don't speak English um, to make sure that they also, you know, get the protection and support that they need. Thank you, uh, council member. I appreciate the very kind words. Um, I'll take them in order as you gave them. Uh, OTA, uh, you know, we have three staff there um, who are supporting that role, obviously, as I, I mentioned um, uh, to uh, council member Rosenthal, uh, we'll continue to evaluate their workload and again, continue to see ways in which we can further embed them in this agency uh, and deepen their scope. I agree with you 100%. We should do more. I look forward to working with you as well as your colleagues on making um, their success better known um, you know, I think they're a real standout group of this agency that has so many great things and proud things to talk about, mm -hmm. particularly in our um, universe of inspectors. Um, I'm sorry. Um, oh, continue. Sorry. Um, uh, uh, sorry, just to highlight a very important but probably not well known, and again, that's on, on us to to be better about talking about our, our successes, um, particularly when it comes to the work of OTA. You know, that group <clears throat> of inspectors sees response times in one day. I mean, that is really quite tremendous uh, work. Um, and that really does show the commitment we've made um, 
to tenants and to responding to their concerns. Um, so on tenant safety, we're with you. We look forward to um, working to grow that unit. Um, I think your second question was on sheds, if I remember that correctly. Somebody will tell me if I'm wrong, but we'll take that. Yes. yes. Um, so, you know, for probably everybody except the Department of Building, sheds are um, never the first thing on their mind except the day that they forget an umbrella and it's raining. Um, but they do provide a service, right? They are an important tool that we use to pro uh, protect New Yorkers. Um, that being said, we obviously know um, that they can overstay their welcome. Um, so we'll look forward to working with you on ideas that you may have um, in ways to support the work that is needed. A shed is up because it is needed to protect us from something. So it is never the end of the story, but for us, it's a very important thing that needs to be in place to make sure that we can continue to be safe. Um, so we'll, I look forward to working with you on ways in which we can collectively uh, strengthen the work the department does to ensure that the work needed gets done so that the sheds may come down uh, for once and for all. And on language access, which I believe is your last one, we do provide translation services for our outreach material, um, particularly when we're doing outreach to workers. We wanna make sure we're providing access to information in all of the 14 uh, common languages um, and certainly any internal communication with our, any staff communication, we also make sure we provide language access for that. So uh, again, if there are areas of particular concern, obviously um, we'll be happy to, uh, to strengthen what we do. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, before we go on, I do wanna ask a question. You brought up sheds and I have another question, not those sheds, but the, um, temporary uh, uh, structures that were assembled during the pandemic um, uh, for outdoor dining. I have gotten this week probably 20 calls from small businesses who said that the DOB has been out requiring that they take their sheds down and finding people. I just wanted to know if you could provide for us the guidance now. Um, you know, I, I had thought that there was a, a, a moratorium kind of on the outdoor structures uh, through the through the warmer weather, but I understand. Li literally, I'm not I'm not exaggerating. I got ten calls from small businesses who said that the uh, DOB had been there and had either fined them or was threatening to find them for dismantling or taking down those sheds immediately. And if you could just provide some guidance, um, it would it would it would be helpful. Yeah, that that would be news to me. I have to look at uh, our um, our enforcement actions. Obviously. We have been part of the process uh, of this city of ensuring uh, we have COVID uh, information getting out there to businesses at all points during the pandemic. So uh, I have to look into that and come back to you, Chair. Okay, I, I don't mind that. I just wanted to know, is, is, do any, have any of my colleagues who are on here gotten the same thing? Because I would hate to think that it was just my district, but those businesses were all in my district that called me. Um, so we, I'll, fo I'll follow up with you offline. I'm sorry, Commissioner. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll, and we'll share with you, we do have guidance uh, on outdoor structures, uh, which I'll make sure we get to you before the end of the day. But let's talk about the enforcement piece. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, if any other council members have questions for the Department of Buildings, please use the Zoom raise hand function now. Otherwise, we will move to the next portion of the hearing where we'll be hearing from the Department of Housing, Preservation and Development. Wait, wait, I'm, I'm sorry. I wanted my second round of, round of questions. Oh. I wanted my colleagues to be able to ask. Um, I have some questions that are specifically related to uh, one, Local Law 196 of 2017, which mandates construction site safety training requirements for workers on certain job sites. Under the legislation, permit holders are required to ensure that all construction and demolition workers and subcontractors employed or engaged at a permitted site have completed the U.S. Department of Labor um, Occupy, Occupational Safety and Health Administration or OSHA 10-hour training course and OSHA 30-hour training course, uh, a 100-hour program of OSHA training or the department's prescribed site training, safety training curriculum. The department's fiscal 2022 preliminary plan includes 350,000 for three budgeted positions related to administrative costs for construction site safety compliance. 
What's the total budgeted funding amount and headcount associated with construction site safety administration and you know that keyword enforcement? Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, uh, the, the sorry, the department's budget includes uh, 219 positions and approximately um, 14.9 million dollars dedicated to construction safety across the agency. Uh, including, of course, um, our enforcement uh, universe in that as well. Uh, can you please give an update to this committee on the work performed by the department in collaboration with the Construction Site Safety Task Force? Sure. Um, so the task force, as you know, was required by the law. It did meet quarterly for two years. Um, this coming October is our next annual meeting of the task force. And as you know, they were instrumental in helping us develop uh, the requirements um, around uh, 196, um, particularly on the education side uh, of that. And, and it's worth knowing or remembering that this past Monday, um, we did reach our final mile, milestone in the implementation of Local Law 196 with workers now needing 40 hours of training uh, on uh, some of our larger sites, as well as their supervisors requiring 62 hours of training. So we look forward to our next meeting of the task force. Thank you. What percentage of the city's construction site receives site safety training? I'm sorry. How many construction site safety inspections were performed in 2020? And, and I'm, cl I'm clear that it was no near, nowhere near what was prescribed. And we know that the pandemic was you know, solely responsible for that, which is why we had to move it out. Um, but still, if you have a number of site safety inspections performed in 2020 and to provide it, that'd be great. Well, we know our construction safety compliance unit, which uh, was established at the end of 2018 and really got um, into the swing of it in 2019, calendar year 2019, we know to date they've done 53,000 inspections, which is um, pretty phenomenal uh, to see that kind of response from the department. And they visited um, just under 23,000 uh, unique sites um, uh, in that work. So um, a very strong group. So can you, give, can you give me those numbers in percentage wise on sites? So what percentage of sites were seen? And to date? So what I can say is we know that the universe of our larger sites, so these are sites that require construction supers, uh, um, uh, site safety coordinators or managers, we know that universe is approximately 4,700 sites um, where safety professionals are required on them. Do you know how many violations have been issued because of these inspections? Sure, so um, CSC, our Construction Safety Compliance Unit, um, has issued uh, uh, over 25,000 violations um, and about 5,000 stop work orders as part of its work. Um, a smaller universe of that total number is specific to uh, violations found of, of Local Law 196. And those that were found uh, of, in violation of Local Law 96 didn't necessarily receive a stop work order, correct? Uh, correct. So the violation uh, for um, 196, specifically 196 violations, we've issued uh, nearly uh, 2,700 violations at 544 sites. And so in those instances where we find uh, uh, workers without uh, the required training, just to be clear and remind folks, our enforcement action in that universe is specifically to the property owner, the general contractor, and where uh, required any subcontractors. Never do we issue a violation to the worker. Is there a, is there a fine associated with local law 96, 196 violation? Yes, it's $5,000 for every violation we write, and again, um, uh, if we go to a site, we'll be issuing at minimum two violations, one to the owner, one to the contract, the general contractor. And in some instances, we issue three to the subcontractor being the third. So is there an instance where, because that fine, with all due respect, is, is nominal on a large site, that people just continue to work, pay the fine, and continue, and continue to, to, to work in the same way? I would say this, we've seen 
very good compliance thus far with the requirements of meeting the milestones for uh, uh, the safety requirements. So we've issued over, our providers have issued over 121,000 cards. Um, and then you compare that uh, to the number of violations we found on sites. And again, the construction safety compliance group is tasked solely with um, visiting these sites specifically. Those are the sites they go to, nobody else goes to them, that's CSC's job. So when you look at the universe of violations they've written for um, specifically 196, um, uh, relative to the number of sites we've gone to, uh, it's a smaller universe. So I think compliance in the universe is uh, very strong. And obviously, um, if we see a large number of site, uh, workers at a site without training, we'll issue a stop work order. Um, uh, and then obviously in those instances, we're coming back to ensure compliance. So I think the penalties are quite large. Um, I think the compliance has been quite good. And I think our power of uh, stopping jobs um, uh, by using our stop work orders and the fact that we will come back um, has proven to be a successful recipe. So there's been a, a uh, as we mentioned earlier, there's been a record number of construction accidents this year, unfortunately. What is BOB doing to ensure that the number of fatal construction accidents does not increase? And I kind of know the answer to that because I've actually seen while there may have been a record number of accidents, there seems to have been less a number of like, fatalities in those accidents, which we had a conversation about this and, and, and you know, nobody wants accidents on, on, on sites, but the fact that I feel like, and this may be anecdotal, you may, you may have different numbers, that the, the fatality number um, is, is, is not the same. Um, uh, so so uh, what, what, is, what, what are we doing? Yeah. So similar to OTA, um, the work we do around worker safety um, and the work my inspectors do in the field um, is probably uh, high among my proudest um, uh, parts of DOB. Um, this year, uh, in the last month, we did have three fatalities. Uh, two of the three were related to worker fall, um, and the other was a, uh, an elevator incident that we've uh, spoken about. Um, but I do want to talk about the good here for a moment um, because we've seen a decrease in incidences and we've seen a decrease last year in fatalities. Last year we had eight fatalities. I do want to sort of catch this as uh, there was an interruption in work uh, due to the pandemic where we saw a significant number of sites paused. Um, and for the previous uh, five years before, we were holding at 12. So there are good things to talk about. Um, there's good things to talk about in the fact that we know worker training and our proactive inspections, those two together have proven to be successful. We know that when we visit sites without advance notice and that when workers are armed with the knowledge of how to protect themselves and how to be aware of danger around them on job sites, that those two things lead to less injuries. This is an area that is very important to this department and we think we can do more um, around this specific thing. But I do wanna just take a moment to talk about the three fatalities we've had this year. Um, we had three in February, as I mentioned, two falls, one due to an elevator incident. And I wanna underscore this very important philosophy that at least I have, and I know, Chair, we've talked about this and, and we share this. No worker should ever be put in a position where um, they're not going home safely to their families. That is a very fundamental part of what we are tasked with doing. Um, uh, you know, Having a fatality on a job site is traumatic. It's traumatic for the people on that site who now have to look, um, uh, who have to witness that. It's traumatic for the family, obviously not only emotionally that they've lost somebody, but in um, uh, many instances, the person who is deceased, the deceased worker is a primary earner for that family. That can have devastating uh, impacts um, beyond the, just the fact of uh, loss of life. So um, we know sorry to get very uh, in the weeds here, but we know 
um, fatalities and injuries can continue to go down. We know what it takes to do it, proactive inspections, uh, training, more safety training. Um, and so we can, we'll look forward to, to our work. Sorry, again, long, long winded answer. No, 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 thank, thank, and thank you for that answer. I believe I see uh, Council Member Riley. Is that who I see? I can't, I can't see. I'm sorry, no, that's Council Member Moy, I'm sorry. Um, an increase in the mayor's emergency um, EO 120 and EO 123 has DOB been, I'm sorry, in accordance with, in accordance with the mayor's emergency executive order 120 and executive order 123, have the DOB been checking construction sites for compliance with the employer safety plans required by the New York State interim guidance? Yes. Um, so during the pandemic, we've, we've had a lot of, I think I mentioned in my testimony, we've worn a lot of hats during this pandemic. Our inspectors, our team here has gone from, you know, code enforcement, from uh, zoning, uh, uh, re uh, the zoning resolution enforcement, um, and added, right? We've not, we've not subtracted, we've not stopped working, we've continued to work fully throughout the entire pandemic. So we've added to that the role of um, health and safety. And so um, we started uh, the pandemic where construction was essential. And so my, my team was going out there ensuring compliance. Um, we pivoted to construction um, being uh, becoming um, in many instances, non-essential work. And so my team again pivoted to ensure that the ban that was in place was adhered to. Um, and then construction came back uh, as essential work. And so in, uh, uh, back in early June, we again pivoted to now doing inspections on all of those sites. And we did that for a month at no penalty where we were sending weekly updates to sites on their scorecard of our inspection visit so that um, permit holders, uh, RDPs and owners knew exactly what uh, we were finding. And we had added to our usual work on the health and safety checks to ensure compliance with our guidance on COVID requirements on sites um, and so where we found infractions, we issued violations. Those violations carried a penalty of $5,000. Where we found certain infractions, we issued stop work orders. Um, so the team has been hard at work uh, on the COVID front as well. Uh, thank you. And just um, uh, one more uh, kind of <laughs> overarching question is, um, the Department of Buildings contract budget in the fiscal 2022 preliminary plan is 2.6 million, less than its fiscal 2021 adopted budget. This is primarily due to a 2.3 million reduction in spending for general contractual services and professional computer services, thereby eliminating, uh, looks like nine contracts. Could you please provide the services that the department will no longer be procuring? Can you let us know what those services are? that the department will be no longer procuring? And will the decrease in these services impact the operations of the department? Sure. Um, I'll let Sharon get into the details, but broadly speaking, um, we've not made uh, cuts. I think we had a conversation with um, uh, the council's finance staff to clarify here. Um, but as mentioned in my testimony, we'll see some delays in contractual services, but the bottom line is there is no impact to our operations. So there actually isn't a, a change in the spending for contractual services. So we're gonna have to uh, address this. So um, my staff's following up with the financial staff to clarify the information and we can discuss the issue with them further. I was, I was waiting for the time that I was gonna be able to say uh, good morning, Sharon, before it was too late. So go, <laughs> go, go, good morning. <laughs> good morning, Sharon, um, how are you? I, I'm good, thank you. I don't, I don't have any more questions, um, okay. uh, General Counsel, thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, if there are no further questions from other council members, we will now move on to the next portion of the hearing where we will be hearing from the Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Are there any other council member questions? Okay, um, Chair, I will turn it back to you to introduce this portion of the hearing. And I will also hand over committee council functions to my co-counsel, Austin Branford. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Austin. Morning. Hey. So I, I guess you could take it away in um, affirming uh, Commissioner Carroll. Welcome, Commissioner Carroll. 
I believe Chair Rosenthal may actually have an opening right now. Um, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. The chair of the subcommittee on capital budget. Chair Rosenthal? Austin, can we? Can That's we just one moment. We're going to sort this out. One second. All right. Just bear with us for one minute here and we'll be on to the next portion. So so generally at this time, for those who are watching, we would be changing seats and all of that <laughs> anyway. So now it's just happening behind the scenes. Yeah. And uh, just make sure I did acknowledge uh, the presence of council member Francisco Moya. Just one more minute here. Hello. I was making a joke. I love you. Bye. I love you. Bye. All right, Chair Rosenthal, if you're ready to make an opening. Ready for you. Oh, uh, I need a minute. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'll yeah. be back in a minute. All right, with apologies. Um, great, thank you so much. I really apologize for the delay. Um, so let's start. Thank you for your patience, Chair Carnegie. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Helen Rosenthal, Chair of the Subcommittee on the Capital Budget. Um, I wanna begin first by thanking my co-chair, Council Member Robert Carnegie and the members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. This joint hearing is truly appropriate because HPD is such a capital intensive agency with an extremely important mandate to preserve and construct affordable housing with precious and scarce resources in a city that has become increasingly unaffordable. New Yorkers, many of whom were already grappling with housing instability before the onset of the um, many of whom were grappling with housing instability before the onset of the pandemic. For them, it's even harder. Due to uncertainties at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic in April, 2020, HPD temporarily halted approval of new capital projects that had been scheduled for the end of fiscal year 2020. OMB pushed about a billion in HPD capital spending from fiscal year 20 and fiscal year 21 into the out years. And these resulted in ostensibly cuts, which were maintained in the fiscal 2021 adopted budget. However, 
In September 2020, HPD resumed its capital program and its preliminary capital commitment plan for fiscal year 21 through 25, which totals $6 billion and moves $454 million back into fiscal year 2021 for increased affordable housing production in this current year. This budget action means that thousands of previously delayed affordable units can now secure the financing needed to move forward in the months to come. I would like to learn more about the impact of that temporary pause, what it had on the affordable housing production pipeline, and the challenges HPD is facing in restarting their capital program in a housing market reshaped by the COVID pandemic. While the shifting of these capital funds back into current, the current fiscal year is one crucial step forward on the front end, questions remain on how funds will be used and which projects are prioritized. Taking the longer view in terms of how HPD is planning to program capital funding, HPD's preliminary capital 10-year capital strategy for fiscal year 22 to 31 totals about 10 billion. It's front loaded, which is great from fiscal year 22 to 25. And so the, but the annual average is about 1.1 billion. But for the last five years, annual funding drops off to around 900 million. It would be helpful to learn what HPD thinks will be needed after it satisfies Housing New York plan to build or preserve 300,000 units of affordable housing by 2026. I strongly support maintaining the current high level of capital investment in affordable housing, given the tremendous unmet need, which has been further exacerbated during the COVID-19 pandemic. When we discuss post-COVID recovery efforts, the production of affordable housing must be at the forefront of these conversations and efforts. I look forward to engaging with the administration on these important topics and discussing strategies to ensure the pace of affordable housing production and the target of capital resources to meet the current moment. Thank you so much again. Thank you for your patience, Chair Cornegy. I turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Chair Rosenthal. Um, I'm going to begin with a few questions and do the same thing I did before, allow my colleagues uh, and the co-chair to ask questions and then I'll circle back with the second round and if anyone else sure, has sure, a second. We were going to um, administer the oath to the HPD panelists. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Austin. Sorry about that in their testimony. No worries. Um, so the next panelist to give testimony will be Louise Carroll, Commissioner of the Department of Housing Preservation and Development. She will be joined by Anne-Marie Santiago, HPD Deputy Commissioner of Enforcement and Neighborhood Services, Anne-Marie Hendrickson, HPD Deputy Commissioner of Asset and Property Management, Liz Oakley, HPD Deputy Commissioner of Development, Rich Johns, HPD Associate Commissioner of Financial Management, Margie Brown, HPD Associate Commissioner of Housing Opportunity and Program Services, and Kim Darga, HPD Associate Commissioner of Preservation, who will all be available for questions. I'll now minister the oath. I will call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? First up is Commissioner Carroll. I do. Great. Deputy Commissioner Santiago. I do. Deputy Commissioner Hendrickson. I do. Great. Deputy Commissioner Oakley. I do. Associate Commissioner Johns. I do. Associate Commissioner Brown. I do. And last but not least, Associate Commissioner Darga. I do. Great, thank you all. Commissioner Carroll, you may begin when ready. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Carnegie, Chair Rosenthal, and members of the New York City Council Committee on Housing and Buildings and Subcommittee on Capital Budget. My name is Louise Carroll, and I'm the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Today, I'm joined by Associate Commissioner for Financial Management, Rich Johns, and members of HPD's senior leadership team. It is hard to believe how much has changed since I testified exactly a year ago today at the last preliminary budget hearing. 
Just a few days after that hearing, New Yorkers were asked to stay at home to keep safe from COVID-19, making our work to provide safe, quality, affordable housing more important than ever. Throughout the pandemic, our code enforcement team was out in the field every day to make sure that tenants had heat, hot water, and safe living, living conditions. We launched a revamped Housing Connect system on schedule to make it even easier for New Yorkers to find and apply for affordable housing. We stayed responsive to the urgent needs on the ground, moving more families out of shelter and into long-term housing while coordinating with our partners to keep construction on essential affordable housing projects moving forward as safely as possible. We announced new tools to build up our MWBE and not-for-profit partners to support and strengthen them through this crisis. We also supported citywide initiatives by delivering food and air conditioners to seniors and other, of other vulnerable New Yorkers. The pandemic completely upended the way we live, work, and interact with each other. But our agency quickly adjusted to meet the demands of the crisis and continue our critical services. And for that, I am tremendously grateful to the HPD team. As the city works to rebuild from the pandemic, HPD is looking hard at the devastating health and economic impacts, and frankly, the deeply embedded racial and economic inequities exacerbated by COVID-19. We know that safe, quality, affordable housing will be critical for the health and stability of our most vulnerable residents. And we are also more focused than ever on our efforts to ensure an equitable recovery for all New Yorkers. I appreciate this opportunity to overview and to testify today on HPD's fiscal year 2020 preliminary budget. And I will first provide a brief overview of the budget before describing how the funding will help us to achieve our goals of creating and preserving affordable housing, advancing racial inclusion, equity, and fair housing, and protecting tenants and supporting owners. I'm then happy to answer any questions that you may have. First, the budget overview. As you know, HPD's work requires significant investment from the city and federal governments. HPD's fiscal year 2020 preliminary budget is approximately $1 billion. However, this includes $237 million passed through funding for NYCHA. So aside from this pass through funding, HPD's true expense budget is about $796 million for FY22. Of the $796 million, approximately $108 million comes from the city's tax levy, and about $655 million comes from federal grants. That means 82% of HPD's expense budget is federally funded. This huge proportion of federal versus city funding in the agency's budget means many of our programs are restricted by federal requirements. Our city tax levy is therefore critical for flexibility and strengthening areas not otherwise eligible for federal grant funding, such as administrative functions, like improving our technology to better serve New Yorkers and MWBE mentoring programs like our building capacity courses. There's a new economic reality in New York City and we're responding accordingly. HPD has identified mandatory savings targets that will help make the agency more efficient without affecting our core priorities that make the city fairer and safer for all New Yorkers. We are thankful for the important role that the city resources plays in our expense budget. And my testimony will highlight several areas where city funding will help us further strengthen our programs and our services. Our efforts to create and preserve affordable housing are critical to your home NYC. The mayor's comprehensive approach to helping New Yorkers get, afford, and keep affordable housing. Housing access and affordability are some of the biggest concerns that New Yorkers face. And COVID-19 has only made the need for affordable housing more urgent. 
Initially held back by the pandemic, we moved at record speed in the second half of the year. And when the mayor restored the $454 million to our FY21 budget, we ended 2020 with the second highest total affordable housing production for a calendar year. Since 2014, we have been shattering production records as we progress towards this administration's goal to achieve 300,000 affordable housing homes by 2020. And the mayor's restoration of funding will allow us to stay on track with a sharpened focus on the city's most vulnerable residents, our seniors, the homeless, and New Yorkers barely getting by. In fact, as promised in last year's State of the City, we've changed our term sheets so that at least 50% of our newly financed units will be for New Yorkers earning less than $52,000 for a family of three. A family such as a home health aide and a car wash attendant with a child. In 2020, the city financed 29,521 affordable homes and more than 65% of those new construction homes will serve New Yorkers earning less than $52,000 for a family of three. In 2020, we financed more than 1,000 supportive homes, more than 1,000 affordable homes for seniors, and more than 2,000 affordable homes for homeless New Yorkers. Plus, our Homeless Placement Services team placed 1,223 homeless households into housing that we financed, exceeding its housing placement goal for 2020 by 22%. They also streamlined documentation requirements and inspections in order to move households from shelter to safe permanent housing as quickly as possible. Finally, despite the immensely challenging environment, HPD preserved more than 22,000 homes, bolstering housing stability for approximately 55,000 New Yorkers and created a record 18,125 home ownership opportunities by preserving 17,573 Michelama home ownership apartments. To date, we financed nearly 178,000 affordable homes, enough to serve 445,000 New Yorkers. In terms of advancing racial inclusion, equity, and fair housing, um, our affordable housing production doesn't just stabilize families and communities by providing safe and permanent housing. It also brings jobs critical to strengthening the local economy. Our goal is to ensure that our critical housing work is contributing to a fairer and more equitable recovery. In particular, HPD is committed to creating opportunities for and strengthening the participation of MWBEs and not-for-profits in this growth. In the fall, we announced that on public sites we award for affordable housing development, HPD will require that the team include an MWBE or not-for-profit partner that holds a minimum ownership and financial stake of 25% in the project. In January, we announced that the New York City Acquisition Fund, a $210 million public-private affordable housing loan fund, will exclusively finance projects led by MWEs and not-for-profits with at least a 51% ownership stake. And just last month, HPD launched Pathways to Opportunity, a new initiative providing free training and certification for MWBEs and not-for-profits interested in breaking into the growing marketing agent industry for Housing Connect Lawrence. In a city as diverse as ours, it is only sensible that minority and women-owned businesses and grassroots not-for-profits play a central role in shaping and driving community development as we work to build back better. Just as the COVID-19 pandemic laid bare neighborhood-based inequities and racial inequality, 
It also made clear that we cannot take our foot off the gas when it comes to building a fairer society. In October, after more than two years of planning and community engagement, we released Where We Live NYC, a blueprint for fair housing in the five boroughs. We updated the plan to reflect the disproportionate impact of co the COVID pandemic has had on low income communities of color. And now HPD is hard at work to advance this five year plan to break down barriers to opportunity and build a more integrated, equitable neighborhoods. Right now, we're prioritizing strengthening neighborhoods that have experienced historic disinvestment and discrimination with mixed use placemaking projects that bring affordable housing along with amenities like grocery stores, recreational space, and retail. In light of COVID, we are rethinking how thoughtfully designed housing can help New Yorkers remain safe in their homes and pro promote broader public health. Mold and poor indoor air quality can worsen underlying health conditions that increase COVID-19 risks. While the lack of broadband access can prevent residents from utilizing online learning and emergency services. That's why we recently updated our design guidelines to introduce new recommendations to facilitate broadband access, improve indoor air quality and ventilation, increase access to cooling and outdoor space, and reduce the risk of spreading contagion. Housing quality is at the heart of what we do, and not just in newly developed buildings. HPD is tasked with enforcing the city's housing maintenance code, which covers heat and hot water, mold, pests, gas leaks, fire safety, and more. While the COVID-19 crisis has disrupted so many lives, housing disasters like fires and structurally unsound buildings, lack of heat and electricity, and falling ceilings never stopped here in our city. The work of our enforcement teams took on even more meaning as New Yorkers sheltered at home and we were in and we intervened to protect tenants and support owners, particularly the most vulnerable. In the last year, the city made important strides to protect children from lead poisoning, explaining local law one to to apply to homes where children reside for more than 10 hours a week, and even if they don't live there full time. HPD has been reaching out to property owners to raise awareness about the changes and the resources available to help them. HPD proactively combats tenant harassment. Most recently, our anti-harassment unit secured over $200,000 in penalties from two negligent landlords creating unsafe conditions for tenants. And we continue to monitor them to make sure that they um, are in compliance. This year, we also kept a close eye on the repercussions of the pandemic in order to stay responsive to arising needs. In addition to regular outreach about COVID-19 safety resources and best practices in multifamily buildings, we also launched a number of initiatives to protect tenants during this time with our partners in the affordable housing community and in the city and state government. We helped keep vulnerable New Yorkers impacted by COVID-19 in their homes through initiatives like Project Parachute and our Landlord Tenant Mediation Project, which works to resolve disputes outside of housing. So far, more than 90% of its mediations have produced agreements. COVID-19 laid an immense burden on both homeowners and tenants, and we are stocking our, we are, um, and we are increasing the tools that we have to provide both much needed relief. In December, we released the Security Deposit Alternatives RFEI to identify eligible companies interested in offering alternatives to traditional lump sum security deposits for affordable housing applicants of newly constructed homes. And in February, we announced the expansion of the Homeowner Help Desk, which will support homeowners at risk of displacement in key neighborhoods in Southeast Queens, Central Brooklyn, and the North Bronx. 
The help desk will connect owners with resources and raise awareness about deed theft and scams. Ultimately, all of this work is about fighting for an equitable recovery and building back to ensure all New Yorkers can afford to live, work, and thrive in this city. But we cannot do this alone. I wanna thank the council for its partnership and we look forward to continuing to work together on critical legislative priorities and needed reforms to help New Yorkers pull through and to get to the other side of this crisis as a more affordable and equitable city. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and we look forward to your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. We'll now turn it over to questions from Chairs Carnegie and Rosenthal. As a reminder, if other council members want to ask questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we'll call on you in order. We'll be limiting council member questions to three minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer your questions. Chair Carnegie, go ahead. Thank you so much, uh, committee council. Um, welcome and good morning, Commissioner Carroll. It's always good to see you and thank you for your continued commitment to this hard work that we have to do, especially around um, the pandemic and evictions, moratoriums being lifted. The, I, I know that your work is not easy. Um, so thank you for staying committed uh, to that. You, you got here at a time which is probably one of the most critical and crucial times uh, in the city's history around affordability, around uh, eviction uh, prevention and foreclosure prevention. So I know that it's been incredibly difficult. Thank you. Uh -huh. So um, I'm gonna start with um, the federal stimulus funding uh, and some questions in that area. The, corona, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Act, which is the CARES Act, signed into law in March 2020, provided approximately 12 billion nationally to US Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, for the Community Development and Housing Programs. For New York City, federal aid for Community Development and Housing Programs is estimated to total 972 million. Can HPD provide details on how much federal stimulus money it has received to which programs, i.e. whether it was CBDG grants uh, or Section 8, and how, is it, how are the additional funds uh, uh, slated to be utilized? Thank you, Council Member, for that question. HPD received about $15.8 million in federal grants through the CARES Act. It was specifically for the administration of our Section 8 Rental Assistance Program. The funds were received in about May, June 2020, um, and we have until the end of 2021 to, to spend them. Uh, the funds will be used to cover the um, ongoing expenses for um, our technology improvement of the program and for staff cost. Uh, with COVID-19, um, we, I mean, we, under, we understand that we need to get rental subsidies out to tenants quickly with the least paperwork. Um, but COVID-19 really made that critical. As you know, um, our agency went offline. Most of our employees have been teleworking and we have had to keep the Section 8 program running um, online as well. And you know, having to shut down the first floor where people came in person to carry documents and carry papers, senior citizens were coming to our building regularly. Um, getting this funding has been critical for us to streamline our online application process to reduce the burden of tenants who need these um, rental subsidy resources critically at this time. And so that is what we're gonna do with that um, $15.8 million is to make the burden of applying for Section 8 um, much less to streamline our processes, make sure that owners can see the status of their applications really quickly, that way that helps tenants, and to make sure that senior citizens and other tenants no longer have to come to HPD in order to access our resources. So Commissioner, do we have a timeline for full, full implementation of the programs that you that you've described? So, um, you know, we are working very quickly to with our tech folks to try and use these funds 
by the end of the calendar year. Um, if we aren't able to have all of our um, tech upgrades by the end of this calendar year, we will we will have have it shortly in the next year. So we are bracing at the city council for what we estimate to be a flood of cases once the moratoriums are lifted, both on eviction and on or for, on foreclosure, and the impact on um, communities like ours are going to be devastating. Is there a system in place from HPD's perspective to, to help with that? And if it is, could you just describe it? Okay, so um, at HPD, we run the Section 8 program and we offer tenants rental assistance through that program. Um, throughout the pandemic, we had been advocating with to the, with the federal government in order to provide additional resources, not just um, additional Section 8, but additional emergency rental um, assistance. We, um, we feel we were successful in, in that effort, and we recently accepted as part of the um, new CRF funding that was issued about $251 million for New York City to augment um, its rental subsidies. And the state received about $1.3 million. We have been in constant touch with the state and with HRA to try um, to assist them in thinking through how to get this money out as quickly as possible to tenants. Um, we have been working with our HRA partners throughout the pandemic to assist them in giving their one shots and to make sure that there was no delay in their ability to put that money out. We loaned HRA 30 of our own staff in order to help them at the most critical time to make sure that there was no backlog. Um, we also worked with Enterprise and with the, um, the Mayor's Fund, as well as um, MOPT and the Deputy Mayor's Office to raise funds for Project Parachute. We were successful in raising about $10 million in funds to support the undocumented. As you know, a lot of the federal subsidies are not available to our undocumented residents here in New York City. And we know that um, those folks work in economies that had been very hard hit by COVID. And so the deputy mayor and, and me and Enterprise and Project Parachute and MOPT, we went out and um, to foundations and raised money in order to help home-based providers give rental assistance to the undocumented. Um, we set up with MOPT the landlord mediation um, project with conflict um, dispute resolution centers to make sure landlords and tenants could come to some agreement outside of um, housing court to enter into payment plans. It's no good for the landlord to get no money, right? And it's costly to take tenants to court and we felt that these um, conflict resolution centers, which exist in housing court, could be better used before housing court. You shouldn't have to go to housing court to get a, 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 dis, um, a dispute resolution or mediation assistance. So we worked with MOPT and with HRA to set that up, and it's working really, really well. Um, they have a high um, level of, of, of mediation and settlement between landlords. We continue to canvas the state. So um, we propose that the state legalize payment plans. A lot of people are entering into that now. Smart landlords are doing that now, right? It's better to collect something than nothing. And so a lot of smart folks are entering into these repayment plans with their tenants. What we have advocated on the city side is to um, standardize those agreements, make sure there are proper tenant protections in those agreements. And so we've been advocating with the state to legislate that practice you know, so that there be a standard playing field for everyone entering into these agreements. Um, I may be leaving some of the, some of the amen, uh, amazing, tremendous work that we've been doing. But I do want to say that we are also lenders. Um, and we have been seeing a reduction in rent payments like everyone else. 
to um, our affordable housing owners. And so we have been giving relief to our projects by um, giving forbearance on loans and allowing folks to use the reserves that they have in order to cover the shortfall of rent for tenants. So in short, we're doing a lot. Um, we are concerned as everyone else is at the um, looming deadline for the eviction moratorium, but we're confident that um, further advocacy with the federal government will bring in more rental resources and that we'll be able to work both with HRA and, and the state um, in order to assist tenants. So I'm, I'm really glad to hear you say that there is an open line of communications between uh, HRA and the state and, and you guys. I think that that's gonna be quintessential uh, in addition to the resources, right? Everybody says we need resources, but a lot of the times uh, a, a solid line of communication on behalf of uh, those uh, tenants and homeowners who are going to be disproportionately impacted will smooth this out a, a, a little bit. So I'm, I'm really glad to hear. And I, I'm sure from uh, this committee and from a council perspective, anything we can do in order to assist in the dissemination of information from our respective offices, we would, we would gladly do. So please keep us uh, in the loop. Um, so this past December, Governor Cuomo signed the COVID-19 Emergency Eviction and Foreclosure Prevention Act of 2020. The act places a moratorium on residential evictions until May 1st, 2021 for tenants at, uh, who have endured COVID-related rent hardship. Um, uh, so specific questions, we, we had a, a, a broad understanding of the great work that you're attempting to do in this crisis, but is HPD tracking the number of renters who are behind on rent citywide and at risk of eviction once the moratorium is lifted? Do, do we know that number? Because we should be outreaching those folks uh, now. And, and I'm saying, I, I'd love to get the list of those folks if you have it somewhere aggregated so that I could reach out uh, to, my, to, to people in my community uh, in particular. And every, every member should be able to do that if you have those numbers. So um, our, thank you, council member, for that question. Um, you know, my policy team has been working throughout this pandemic, um, as I said, in order to advocate with the federal government and to raise funds to try to track the need. And we estimate that there may be about 675,000 households in New York City with one or more persons employed in a COVID-19 affected industry. Now, we don't think that all of these households will necessarily need rental assistance. Um, we know that the stimulus checks that the federal government has been sending out, um, including the unemployment benefits has really helped stabilize a lot of households. Um, but we, and so, you know, we are tracking that there's about 75 to 90% rent collection in the city right now. So while we don't have exact numbers, we do know that the people who need help, it fluctuates, right? So the Furman Center has been looking at some of this data, the Treasury has been looking at some of this data, but what we know, especially even through Project Parachute, a family that needed help maybe for about three months, six months, with the city reopening and with businesses working again, suddenly that person has found a job and no longer needs that assistance. So there is some fluctuation in, in the market. And so what we plan to do, I know, um, you know, when HRA comes before you, you can um, ask them more details, but I know that they're putting out an RFP so that they can um, employ not-for-profits to help in the outreach to um, to families who may need assistance. We know from Furman Center data that a lot of the folks in COVID affected um, industries live in small buildings. So they live in buildings of 20 units or less or four units. So we know that we need to target and a lot of those buildings are in the areas that are hardest hit by COVID. So we know we need to target certain neighborhoods. We know we need to target certain property types and, um, you know, so that's what HRA is attempting to do. So it is funny because the same description of renters who are gonna be disproportionately negatively impacted by the eviction moratorium is the same demographic of homeowners that are gonna be disproportionately negatively impacted because we know for a fact that those small homeowners are usually ethnic families 
who have between four and 12 units, if they're lucky, 20 units. Um, um, I think you would agree that the bulk of even our affordable housing stock falls in that same, you know, in that same range. Um, so we have to work um, simultaneously to protect the homeowners and the tenants at the same time because they're almost the same person yes. to some degree, or at least the same demographic of folks. So I, I'm glad you I'm glad you pointed that out, and I'm glad you pointed that we at least have some. While you may not have the numbers, addresses, and names, we do have a a clear direction to go in to be of assistance. Um, and I'd like to continue to work with your office to to kind of drill down even deeper to see if we can get to the doorsteps of those folks and provide them before they ask, right? Because by the time yeah. they ask, it's already too late, quite frankly. So if we can be preemptive on getting the information out, I think, you know, it's, it's going to be great. I'm going to try on my on my behalf to work with you to at least the, the 36th Council District, which um, not because uh, of anything else, but we're one of the hardest hit. Um, um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, see if we can't work together to provide it for the entire 51 member body, but certainly Southeast Queens and South Bronx and, and Central Brooklyn are, are harder hit uh, than others. So if we can concentrate our efforts on trying to get uh, preemptive information to those uh, tenants and homeowners about the services that are available and about the moratorium being lifted, um, people are so panicked and, and have so much anxiety around um, uh, the, the pandemic itself and vaccines that you know, like this is believe it or not, their 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 stable or instability in their housing is like tertiary to their list of priorities, which which is which is crazy, right? When they think about their health and employment, and then you know. So anyway, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but I, <laughs> no, I, I, I would like to work with you. I'm going to because I could I could go on as I'm watching this kind of unfold in my in my head. I could talk about this probably for the rest of the time. I'm going to allow um, for. The, the co-chair to ask questions and other other uh, colleagues to ask questions and I'll come back on a second round if time permits. Oh, great. Thank you so much, Chair Cornegie. Those were great. And I'm just gonna sort of take a capital angle on it. And like you, I'm just gonna ask a couple of questions and then turn it over to the rest of the committee and hopefully come back um, and, and come back for a second round. Um, my first question is about the impact of COVID-19 on the housing market. And Commissioner, you touched on this, um, but, but let's just sort of dig in a little bit. So in 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic upended the city's economy, shifted the housing market. And when the pandemic hit New York last March, the real estate industry was literally brought to a halt. Um, and this was obviously reflected in your capital program. Um, in April, I think, 2020, HPD temporary halted approval of the new capital projects that had been scheduled for the end of FY 2020. And that's usually in terms of seasonality, the biggest chunk that goes out. So you moved about a billion um, into the out years. So I'm wondering um, what you think um, given that you've started up again now, and I guess that would be in January when the pause was actually lifted, um, what do you think the impact was of the pause last spring? How many fewer, if you were to look at the two year period together, how many fewer projects were um, will be let out? Right. So in other words, if you combined FY20 uh, with FY21 together, a two year view, um, how many fewer were let? Um, Does that I, I, I understand your question. Thank you. It is an excellent question, Council Member, and I, I really appreciate it. And, and I say that because it gives me an opportunity to, to show how amazing our team has been <laughs> throughout this pandemic. And so, um, you know, when when we were told that there's a pause and we were going to be teleworking, uh, the folks at this agency, we said, okay, that's right, we won't stop, right? Nothing will stop. The marketing will stop that, that we will continue closing projects, we can do this. Um, and then the pandemic became an economic crisis. And as you all know, um, we, our capital was taken away. And um, 
you know, we felt that um, there's a, a process in producing these units that if we let everybody stop without working, we would put not-for-profits out of business. People would have to be laid off in yep. NWBE firms. Um, our own staff, we couldn't just let um, be followed. They, they had talented people that needed to keep going. And so what we said is we would find a way to continue to produce it to produce. So even when we didn't have capital, we were still closing projects. We were closing some projects thanks to you in the council with just an Article 11 tax exemption. So we looked at everything we had on the table and we thought, okay, what is, what is a cheap deal that we could do with the least resources, even the least um, uh, tax exemption? And so we searched around for some of our preservation deals and we picked those and we went ahead with them. And then we looked around and we said, okay, what MWBE not-for-profit supportive housing deals that are critical that we didn't want to, um, for example, 1921 Atlantic Avenue, we just, these folks had been waiting for a while to close and um, we said, okay, we had some extra federal tax credits, 9% credits, and we said, look, can you use them? Can you go out in the market and sell those and get equity to replace our subsidy? So we'll take our subsidy out. And we don't always have extra tax credits, but thankfully we did. And so we closed projects by letting them take more tax credits than they were previously allotted. And they were able to raise funds in the market and replace our subsidy. We also went to HDC, our financing partner, and said, we don't have any money. <laughs> Can you give us some? So in addition to your own subsidy, will you put ours as well? And you know, there's only so much of that that they could do, but they said yes. And we were also able to close projects that way. And we kept um, weekly meetings with our development partners, basically cheering them on, telling them that there's no that that there's no pause, there's no stop, that they should keep working on the June deals that were delayed because we could get funding at any moment and that they would need to go to keep moving. And so thankfully um, the mayor and OMB restored our funding and those projects were ready to go because we kept doing the closing calls. We kept doing the weekly calls and the due diligence to move the projects. And so by September, actually, OMB said, we'll give you some money, start closing. And we really were closing from about September to December. Um, we closed the June deals in December. And so the reason we're able to say that we had the second highest production year in a calendar year is because of the just awesome team at each <laughs> that you know, just kept going. Commissioner, <laughs> I don't doubt that. And it sounds like you made great strides in that. But just um, can you just tell me what the planned closures were for FY 20 and 21 together? And then what the actual. Yes, so is. every year, our target is 25,000 units. Okay. And so for every um, fiscal year, that is the target. And so um, we had already hit our 25,000 target before COVID hit in 2021. So in fact, when we continued to close projects in, in in, in June and August up till September in the way that I described. Um, you know, OMB said you'd already made your target of 25,000. So, we're, you know, um, we said we weren't going to stop there, right? We were, going to go, we, were going to go, we were going to continue. And so we didn't miss our target. And that's what I want to um, really, really- Sure, sure. No, that's amazing. So in FY20, you hit 25,000 units. I, I don't, I actually prefer to combine the two years. Okay. So for FY 2021, your target is 50,000 units. And as of today, you're at what number? 
given all, everything you've that OMB has let you release? So um, I, I'm going to split it in my head. So for FY, <laughs> so this fiscal year, our target is again the, the 25,000, although my boss has said we need to do better than that and we will. And we have already produced about 11,000 units for, right. our, for our target. For okay. So you think you can hit the next 13 by in the next four months, which actually doesn't sound crazy to me given your seasonality, but is that your goal? Um, if I, if you, our goal is not 13 because my boss has said we need to do better than that. <laughs> but yes, we will hit 13 plus. And then I have another sort of technical question. When you're talking about the 25,000 units, does that include new build and refinancing? Absolutely. So right. the, the reason I ask is because uh, they're only because, you know, I'm trying to make sense of this. And the best way for me to make sense of it is to think about what's happening in my district. So in my district, there was a project that was supposed to close um, in uh, last last spring. And it has now, we've now said that it'll happen this spring. For some reason, it wasn't in that first tranche in the fall or the second tranche in winter. And I'm just, you know, the tenants there are completely freaked out because um, what was negotiated was something that was good for them that they could afford. Um, and, and now, you know, the, 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 it's been a year um, and they're freaked out. So I don't know if you can tell us, you know, as, as Chair Carnegie was saying, sort of what was in the package for 20, uh, what got done in 20, what's now in the package for 21, and what's going to get done in 21. And, the, and I'm especially curious on the preservation side because hypothetically that shouldn't, you, I would imagine there would be a way of rethinking the financing so it doesn't have to all go out in the first year so that you could in fact do the financing for, um, you know, the, the refinancing for buildings in order to preserve um, without a problem. Um, thank you, Councilman. I, I, I really appreciate that question because um, we say, we tell folks in advance when they're going to close and we tell them in advance so they can be ready to meet the closing deadline. So um, we have told people a year in advance, whether they're in June or December. But every year, there are some projects that don't make it to the finish line. So we always have the, the, the first tier and the second tier of projects just in case projects don't make it to the finish line. So um, I would love to talk to you um, separately about the particular one you mentioned, but there are times where, you know, we are only the gap filler. We're only a portion of the funds in a project. A, a, a development needs other, other sources of income. Of course, of course. And, you know, I'm not, I mean, I'm happy to go through my specific one, but I feel like, I hope I am speaking for all my colleagues yeah. who all have their specific one that, you know, got bumped and, and there's no reason why, which is why I go back to Chair Carnegie's first question of, is there a way to provide the list sort of, you know, for last year and this year, and you can even include what was in your first priority, second priority, or feasible to do quickly, not feasible to do quickly. I think it would really benefit council members to understand that better, only not not necessarily, not to question, but so they can know what they're talking about when we're talking to our constituents who are asking us, where are we, right? Um, I think that kind of clarity would be incredibly helpful for council members, um, especially if, as you're saying, it sounds like you're really going to get all 50,000 done in the two year span plus more, you know, you're going to get to 60,000 or whatever the number is. But, um, you know, I think that sort of clarity would be incredibly important. Is that something you would have available ready to go over? Um, you know, this is, it's an, this is an excellent question because, um, you know, we, we're constantly refining who's ready and who's not ready. What we do is we tell people in advance and um, that, that they're closing or they're not closing. And council members 
call me, text me, email me all the time, where is my particular project? And I, our team is very transparent when that happens about where it is and why. <laughs> of course, of course. And unfortunately, I don't have your cell, so I'm not one of them texting and calling you. But uh, perhaps what would be easier, again, is just to send over to the central staff uh, what the list is so we wouldn't have to be bothering you. I'm sure you have plenty more important things to do than to answer a specific council member's question about a specific project. Um, and besides, you know, honestly, you have way more important things to do. And um, if you have the list, I, I just, I, I mean, this will be the last time I'll say it, but it just strikes me that sharing the list with the council would be helpful to all New Yorkers so that all New Yorkers could go to whatever source they have, whether it's HPD or their council member, to find out and to relieve their anxiety, especially at a time when everyone, everyone's anxieties level have doubled because of COVID. And it strikes me that you, you obviously know exactly what's going on and, um, and your staff I'm sure, I, you know, I'm just sure that in your office you, you have a list and I'm just asking if you can send it over to um, the city council so we could be as well informed. I'll let it go there. Yeah. I trust your answer is yes and I'll pass um, it back to Chair Cornegan. So, council member, I, I'm happy to talk about this offline. Um, the list, you know, there, my team has lists that change regularly. We have closing big closing meetings in this agency where there are always updates, you know, where are they with their plans? Of course. Are they with DOB? Of Do course. They have a blender? Of course. And, and that's why the word draft is so important and <laughs> subject to negotiation and change. It's easy, you know, people can understand the notion of draft. Um, you know, what we're trying to look at is what your mindset is. And uh, of course, you know, that's watermark, things subject to change, you know, put that right on there. Uh, we can handle that. We can talk offline. Thank you, Chair Cornegie. Thank you, Helen. I mean, Council Member Rosenthal. Um, <laughs> uh, so I actually, unfortunately, want to piggyback a little bit off of uh, Council Member Rosenthal. And I'm having a real serious issue with closings but not so much the affordable tenant units, but my pathways to home ownership. So mm -hmm. it's that none of the home ownership programs are closing. And I know that we're probably, you're probably gonna tell me that you're prioritizing um, the, the tenant, but my office is filled with calls from responsible developers who are very close to closing affordable, affordable home ownership programs who have gotten pushed way out and um, while obviously you've demonstrated and illustrated a priority around closing these affordable units, which are, which are more, right? So you, you, you I'm get, I, I got, I got people who have three, you know, these are three family units that they're eight in a, in a small lot, you know, or, or even smaller. And if you were looking at what would have the greatest impact, potentially you would say, if I'm the commission, I'm going to go, listen, I can get 11,000 units here. I can only get, you know, seven or eight units here. But the home ownership piece is now and has been a tremendous uh, opportunity for for minority communities. So I, I'm getting inundated with these calls around these closings, and um, I just want to know what the guidance is on it. And 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 obviously we, we don't have any money, right? I get, that. <laughs> I get that. So you don't have to say that to me. But I do know that that there is a priority and an order by which you're operating at HPD. Um, around providing affordable housing, uh, affordable housing tenant units. Um, I, I'd like to see a greater mix in terms of priority, right? Yeah. And, and so I'd like to, I'd like to, I would personally like to put some, some members of our communities on pathways to home ownership through the programs that HPD offers and close some of these. Um, um, there, there are, and, and, and actually there are developers who at their own peril now are not closing these who've made significant investments because of my urging and your urging and because of the city's mandate. And now they're going to take a tremendous loss. So there, there's the loss to these small, and, and they're smaller developers, by the way. So we're not talking about the huge developers. These guys who are doing the affordable home ownership piece 
are not the big guys, right? Because there's really no money there. But there are people who are committed to putting people on pathways. So they're taking an L. And then the potential for these home ownership units are taking an L. And, 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 and most of those units are two and three families. So the families who are, are, are prescribed to be there at, at below market are also taking, taking a, a loss when we don't close these programs. Uh, thank you, council member, for that question. Um, so, like the council, this administration believes in home ownership. Um, we understand that home ownership amongst um, black and brown communities has been on the decline. And so, um, we take home ownership very seriously. This year was one of our biggest years for home ownership as we uh, financed about 18,000 homes. One of those was preserving a very large um, Michelama home ownership project called Co-op City. Um, another one was preserving Cooper's um, Square, a CLT co-op. Um, we also did Rochester, um, Sudam, which is an open door project. It had 11 city owned parcels, which was developed um, with 78 cooperative units across several, seven buildings. Um, we also did the bed -Stuy Central and North Phase 1 and 2, where we're about to do the bed -Stuy, uh, Phase 1 North and 2, which is also an open door. Um, I, I hear you, we would like to do more. Um, one of the things that we're working on in um, at HPD is trying to increase the down payment assistance so that it's not just what we produced at HPD for people to be able to buy a, a home, but that people would be able to go out in the market and buy affordable homes that are naturally occurring on the market as well. So in terms of in trying to increase the production and preservation on our end, we're also trying to increase the capital that folks have in their hands to go out and um, pay down payment assistance. So right now it's $40,000 in down payment assistance that we give and we're working to use our home funds to increase that um, to, to about $100,000. And so we, um, in addition to that, we have our home fix program, which the council has helped us with, um, where we are doing giving um, grants or low cost loans to homeowners to rehab their property and possibly um, have a unit that they could also rent to a low income household so that they can um, receive the funding that they need to continue to maintain their properties. We, um, but we hear you, we need to do more and we are working on it. Home ownership is an, a, a tough, a, a harder um, thing to produce, but we're gonna to continue to do it because it is one of our priorities. So, so I, I, I respect and appreciate, and this wasn't an indictment this time on the, <laughs> the, the, the willingness to produce it. I'm, I'm really though asking about these uh, closings that are not happening. So these are already in the pipeline They've already been, I'm assuming, funded to a particular degree, but they can't get the closing done. Um, I, I'm referring more to that. I know it's in the pipeline, especially in, in Bed-Stuy. Um, and and I'm, I'm thrilled about those opportunities. But I, I also have in Bed-Stuy at least two open uh, closings where, where I'm being told that there is, a, it's, it's really open-ended and it's kind of no closing on the horizon. And, 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 and it's those that I'm, that I'm, and, and we may have to have this conversation offline, but I do want to bring to your attention that, are, that there are, in addition to the great work that you're doing to secure uh, affordable housing units and the programs that allow for that, we literally have closings out there that there's not enough money in the budget to close. Does that require a public-private partnership to close them? Like, what is it going to take to close them uh, so that it can get th th these pathways? So uh, thank you, Council Member, for that question. I know that you're talking about our, our open door program. And um, like I said, you know, it is um, very expensive to try to put all the sources together, but we are working diligently on those projects to get them across the finish line, um, you know, because we're trying to meet a very low income target. And so um, we, we, we hear you and we're going to keep working on it.
And, and I'm going to keep working with you uh, uh, offline to see what we can do and what we could leverage to have those come to fruition. So it's, a, it's, you know, it's a, it's kind of a legacy thing for me as we, uh, especially in this, in this time, right? It seems as though uh, I don't want to come out of this pandemic with the same inequities that existed prior to it. So if we, it, I feel like if we concentrate on um, uh, fixing some of this through home ownership and through other, and through MWBE and all of that during, while it's tough, then we won't have to, you know, there's a saying <laughs> in the hood that says, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. So if we, if we, even in this tough economic time, commit to doing these things, then we'll come out of it. And, and the next time this cycle happens again, it'll be less of an impact because we will have hunkered down in, the, in this period. So is that I'd like to talk about later. And I'm sorry, I, I know that my other colleagues uh, have questions, but you know that, that, that's important to me. And I just wanna figure out a way to not have us on the same vicious cycle that we seem to be on, because we're, we're going to recover from this. We're New York freaking city. So we are absolutely going to recover. How we recover and who who has, whether we've moved the needle in the tough time is going to be the same situation. We'll, there'll be, unfortunately, because of the way we're, the world works, there'll be another pandemic. Um, will we have worked hard enough on the inequities in the healthcare system to make sure that it's not negative, as negative an impact? Will we have worked hard on affordability around home ownership so that it's not the same impact is, is, is my question. And I, I think we have an opportunity to do that, even, whatever it takes to do it so that we don't have the vicious cycle in this time. And, th and that, that, was, that was for all the agencies to hear. That wasn't just for you. <laughs> I actually think we can do this if we you know, spend some political capital to see to it that we don't get on this treadmill again. So thank you for that, allowing me that rant. Um, and we'll talk offline about how to close uh, some of these open um, uh, home ownership programs. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, we'll now call on council members to ask questions in the order they've used the Zoom raise hand function. We have also been joined by council members Gibson and Barron. Council members, please keep your questions to three minutes, including responses. If there's a second round of questioning, council member questions will be limited to two minutes. A sergeant in arms will keep a timer and let you know when your time is up. We will first hear from council member Salamanca, followed by council member Moya. Time starts now. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, chairs. Uh, how are you, Commissioner? Thank you. Um, you? First, first, Commissioner, I, I want to start by uh, by saying thanking you for being extremely accessible when I call and I reach out. You know, um, I know we don't always agree on the decisions that are made, but um, but to be able to have that dialogue, it, it, it means a lot. And, you know, not all commissioners do that. So I want to say thank you. Um, uh, I, I was going to ask questions about the projects that are on the pipeline, uh, but it seems that Councilmember Cornegy and Rosenthal really honed in on that. So um, I want to I, I want to ask more on um, my 15 percent homeless set aside bill that was passed last year. Um, do you have a number of how many homeless families uh, will put it into affordable housing units because of that bill? So um, thank you, Council Member. That is an, an excellent question. I, I can tell you that our homeless numbers, again, this year was the second highest production. And um, this year we, we uh, financed about two, just over 2,000 homeless units. But in addition to that, our homeless placements which is a separate initiative that we did. So in addition to the homeless units that we financed, which is over 2000 of them for 2020, um, during the pandemic, we went to our affordable housing partners and said, for everything that's in marketing, starting in, in about March, April, we want you to increase the set aside to about 30% so that we can get people out of shelters quickly in this pandemic and get people into housing. And um, we started with uh, just with NYSAFA and we expanded it to every unit in, in marketing. And with this effort, council member, we have had 772 move-ins in addition to the homeless units that we financed. We have about 198 
buildings participating in this program for about 1,647 units. Only about 1,036 have TCOs. So we expect to continue to place folks in our buildings in response to this crisis. So in addition to the great work you've done um, with the city to get this set aside, we are responding with our partners to say, in this crisis, we got to help people um, of the city. And for things that are going through marketing, um, we're pushing people to go up to 30%. Not everybody can go up that um, to 30%. You know, some we, some of those folks might- Time expired. I, I understand, thank you. And then just to close off, um, I know that Councilmember Corning and Rosenthal were talking about the closings and the frustration that both sides have. Uh, I know HPD and also the, the you know, uh, us council members who are negotiating this with the community and then the developers, you know, you know, whether they're for profit or a nonprofit, um, you know, th there's a frustration there. Um, I have a bill that would, and, but also the frustration is that we don't know how many units or how many development projects um, are waiting on a pipeline. <clears throat> so a uh, council member Cornegie, you know, I have a bill that I would love to get heard soon where it would require the HPD reports on a quarterly basis as to how many projects were closed. Um, and those projects that are not closed that are on the pipeline, they have to give us an explanation as to why they were not closed. And that should be public information. And so with that, I want to say- Not only will I push that bill, I'll make sure my name is on it. Yes, yes. Right. Thank you. Th thank you, chairs. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you, council member. May I, may I just um, say that we publish all of the projects that were closed, it's on open data. Um, so um, I just wanted to, to... No, that, and that's great, but we don't know why th we, there are projects that are not closed and why they were not closed. And I think that that should be open data too. All right, thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Council Member Moya, followed by Council Member Chin. Time starts now. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you to uh, both chairs for uh, allowing me to uh, ask a question couple of questions. It's good to see you, Commissioner. Uh, I'm just going to read you two quick questions, see if you can answer them. Um, given the economic hardship facing the city of New York as a result of COVID, uh, what programs have uh, has HPD been forced uh, uh, to reduce or to cut out completely? For example, heirs uh, in terms of financing affordable housing, and how have these programs uh, been chosen? Uh, thank you, Council Member, uh, for that question. So um, we have been very efficient uh, with the economic crisis in um, reducing our budget while not compromising our functions and the services that we provide. Um, with respect to heirs, the heirs program has not been um, has not been cut. So we the zoning resolution provides that affordable independent residences for seniors can be uh, financed with a regulatory agreement by an agency. And our SARA program is our HPD program for affordable um, independent residences for seniors. And so we continue pr to produce senior housing as, as part of um, this plan. And to date, we have produced over 9,000 units of senior housing. There is a, we attempted to take advantage of the zoning resolution to try to allow privately financed heirs, meaning projects without city subsidy. And um, we created a term sheet to try to do that, to stretch the zoning resolution, even though it wasn't written that way. Um, because we thought we would be able to take an advantage of an opportunity. After further study, um, we've come to the realization that um, we didn't want in rezoned areas that um, we wanted to make sure that a variety of housing was produced for families and for all types of New Yorkers. And so we pulled back that term sheet, which attempted to stretch the zoning resolution, but the heirs program is alive and well, and we're producing senior housing with our HPD term sheet. Commissioner, I'm, so just so I'm clear, cause you know, I, I've been doing some, uh, we've been doing these rezonings as chair. 
and we've been getting back from uh, uh, the folks that we work with that ATV is no longer doing the EARS program. So I just want to be clear, there is money in the budget for to continue uh, financing EARS? So absolutely. So our SARA term sheet mm -hmm. is our senior housing term Time sheet. expired. And we, and we use that term sheet to finance AIRS projects. In fact, we requested the AIRS program in order to help the SARA program function better. So, I, I, and, and I'll, 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 maybe I'll come back because I just had uh, a meeting about uh, a project in my district mm -hmm. uh, where they were told that uh, HPD is no longer uh, doing AIRS because there is no money uh, in the budget. So I'm just... I'm just yeah. asking because this is uh, the total opposite of what we were told. So, the, and this is a great question, Councilman, and I really appreciate it it's so that I can help clarify. Um, there's some confusion between privately financed affordable independent residences for seniors mm -hmm. versus government financed affordably, affordable independent residences for seniors. And the heirs program was drafted so that governmentally financed residences for seniors could have a, a um, certain setback and bonus and bulk in order to maximize the amount of affordable housing for seniors that can be produced. What we tried to do at HPD, and we were maybe um, too clever, is we tried to stretch the zoning resolution to allow privately financed in affordable residences for seniors. And that is the program that we're no longer doing because we Understood. want the city to be able to have a say in the types of housing produced in rezoned areas. And we do not want one type of housing only to be produced. We would like a variety of housing to be produced in rezoned areas. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. We'll now be hearing from Council Member Chin, followed by Council Member Barron. Good time, we'll begin now. Am I on me? Okay, great. Thank you, Chair, and it's great to see you, Commissioner, and thank you to your team. Um, we uh, work well with the HPT team, and I just wanna follow up the question about senior housing. Um, October 2017, the, the mayor announced senior, you know, first initiative. And so what is the, the progress on committing to build, you know, 30,000 um, units uh, for uh, seniors? Are we on track? You just talked about um, so far 9,000. So are we on track in terms of uh, the number of senior housing that will be built? Because right now, one in five New Yorkers are seniors. And I think among all my colleagues, people who call, they call about senior housing. So are we on track on that? And my other question is, I know you talk about the home ownership for Mitch Obama, um, and you did some uh, upgrade, you know, digitizing the waiting list. And I think that is something that is really um, concerning because there were issues about waiting lists uh, for Mitch Obama program uh, housing, and we want to make sure that people have the opportunity uh, to get into uh, those development and be able to have a home ownership or affordable housing. Uh, thank you, Council Member, for, for that question. Um, I, I'll start with the, the last one um, first, which is the Michelama program. Um, we, you know, we've had technology challenges in, in upgrading that program, but we are working diligently to digitize the waiting list, clean up the waiting list, um, make sure that uh, what's being, the information that's coming from the Michelama development to our team and going back is, is clean and accurate. Mm -hmm. 
we're also um, make, making sure that people don't have several bites at the apple because sometimes you go to a person on the waiting list, they look at the unit and they say, oh, I don't like that one. And they're still on the waiting list. You offer another one, they say, oh, I don't, I don't like that one. And um, you, we can't get through a waiting list in, in that way. And so we're starting to reduce the amount of times people can reject a unit to maybe once or twice, and then they're off the waiting list. Um, so this has uh, been a priority for, for me since I, I came in. Um, it's been a priority from all of the um, advice we've been getting from other constituents, including um, legislators and, and advocates. And so my team is at, at, at the moment continuing to digitize until the Your time has expired. Uh, I just want to answer a little bit about uh, senior housing. We've produced over 10,000 units, actually. Um, and we, you know, we have a goal of 15,000 uh, upgrades in preservation that, that contributes to the 30,000 number. So we think we will keep pace. Um, it is, it has been um, a little, a little slow, but we believe we will keep pace to try to meet that 30,000 number. Okay. Thank you. We will now hear from Council Member Barron followed by Council Member Gibson. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the chair for having this important hearing. And thank you to the panel for coming and presenting the information. Good to see you again. In terms of uh, the subsidy that the city offers, is there a range? What's the maximum? Is it one set fee? Can it be altered? Can it be modified? Can you share that with us in terms of what the uh, subsidies are? Absolutely. Thank you so much, um, council member, for that question. We have several different term sheets um, that we publish on our website. And our subsidy is per dwelling unit. Right. And so um, if it's the extremely low income housing program, there is a certain amount of subsidy per dwelling unit that we publish if the um, developers meet our requirements. If it's a supportive housing program term sheet, that is a different subsidy amount per dwelling unit, again, if the developers meet our um, specific requirements. And uh, there is yet another for our senior housing <laughs> term sheet, our SARA term sheet, as well as our open door, which is our home ownership program. So we have several different programs and we um, give a different subsidy amount per dwelling unit produced in each, for each of these different programs. So supportive housing is more expensive to produce. And so um, I, I haven't looked at that term sheet in a while, but um, that amount per dwelling unit would be more expensive because we have a lot of community facility and offices for services, et cetera, in supportive housing. We create those term sheets with the approval of OMB. And so when we propose an amount of subsidy per dwelling unit, we send that to OMB and that there's a negotiation back and forth between us and OMB before we land at the final amount that we will give per dwelling unit uh, provided. And is there any uh, variance or is it a range or is it a set number? Can it be modified? Are there alterations or the circumstances that make it might make it go above what the term sheet actually uh, is presented as? So it is um, in some instances, and, and um, I'm gonna ask uh, my deputy commissioner for development to come, come in because I haven't looked at that term sheet now for about a year. Um, in some instances, there is a set number. In some instances, there's a range. Um, there may be reasons why the um, a project goes above term sheet. For example, there may be our projects are increasingly complex. Sometimes there's a lot of infrastructure associated, maybe sewer infrastructure or other infrastructure that is that is not really a dwelling unit issue. Um, sometimes time has expired. 
I'm going to speed up. Sometimes we may be asking for open space, or we may be asking for um, other amenities for the residents that's not strictly a, a creation of the unit. And so that may make a project more expensive, we, which may make us have to go back to OMB and ask for us to increase the funding. Um, just uh, one more thing is that um, in terms of our projects that we financed in 2020, um, we have told developers that they will not close during the pandemic if their projects are not at or below our term sheet range. And so in order to stretch the money that OMB was giving us, we have been very strict with developers that their projects have to come in at or below term sheet or they will not close. So if you hear that some people did not close in 2020, they probably could not come in at or below term sheet. And we, we've said that um, if there is any project that is above our term sheet number, it has to be for something or different, right? And so, for example, sewer funding would be DP requiring sewer funding or that they have a big infrastructure project that EDC is contributing to and therefore the, the housing is more expensive. Thank you. Was, was there someone who was gonna give some uh, data? If Mr. Uh, Chair, I could. So I, I'd like to call on Ms. Oakley if she wanted to talk a little bit more about our term sheets. Mr. Chair, can I get a little more time? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. I'm sorry, Council Member, of course. Hi, um, thank you, Council Member Barron, for that question. And thank you, Commissioner, for the opportunity to speak more about our term sheets. Um, the commissioner was spot on that we do have a variety of um, subsidy levels depending on the term sheet because we look to maximize the federal resources that we can bring into deals and then modulate the necessary city subsidies to fill the gap. And so our SARA and our supportive housing term sheets where we're able to leverage federal tax credits are at a lower subsidy per unit amount than, for example, our open door term sheet, which does not um, currently have access to such tax credits. Um, so we do have um, a variety of different sources. Um, in addition, there are sometimes additional costs that come along with particular sources and we're modulating for that as well. Um, so we set our term sheets on an ongoing, um, we, we reevaluate them on an ongoing basis. Um, and we are constantly looking at the um, uh, sort of average costs to see what is appropriate. I will say that um, I appreciated the chair's comments at the beginning about um, the relevance of HPD's work to the crisis. Um, and we have tried to maximize whatever advantages we see in a lower interest rate environment. And we did take OMB's feedback very seriously throughout this crisis that we needed to bring every project below term sheet. Um, and so we communicated that to our external partners and we've had tremendous success in bringing down costs where possible due to the prevailing market conditions. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll follow up offline to get what those subsidies amounts are. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Yes, ma'am. Um, I do also want to acknowledge the presence of uh, Council Member Vanessa Gibson. I don't know if we acknowledged her. She is, she's also um, in the room. Uh, we will now hear from Council Member Gibson. Sorry? Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. A couple more questions. So, Council Member Gibson, you're up next. Oh. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Good afternoon. Good afternoon. afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair Carnegie, Chair Rosenthal, all my colleagues. Thank you so much, Commissioner Carroll, to you and your team at HPD. I appreciate uh, as well, uh, Councilmember Salamanca acknowledged your responsiveness, and I really appreciate that on behalf of my district in the Bronx, the Jerome Neighborhood Plan that we passed back in 2017. There are a lot of housing projects that we obviously want to see come to fruition. So I appreciate your office and all of the work you've done. Uh, during this pandemic, it's, it's certainly not been easy. I just had a couple of questions I wanted to present to you. Number one, I wanted to get an update on the Landlord Ambassador Program, where we are with that. I remember there was a partnership with Enterprise 
Uh, and last year's budget, while the program remained flat, I don't know where we are this year. Second, I wanted to ask about an update on CLTs, Community Land Trust. I know you mentioned to me that you have a new dedicated staff to handle CLTs, and there are a number of projects that are in the pipeline across the city. So I'd like to get an update on that. And then thirdly, uh, the state budget is looming ahead in the next few weeks. We will have a state budget by April 1st. I'm wondering if there will be any opportunities for us as a city to get additional resources on the 4%, 9% tax credits, all the incentive programs that we get support from Albany on. Uh, will that be a possibility since everyone is talking in the same voice about adding more affordable housing opportunities across the city? Um, and then the final thing, I want to ask about the cluster housing phasing out that you are working on with DHS. I got a call a couple of weeks ago from DHS about 600 new units that are being phased out and turning back over to affordable housing. So I didn't know what that meant in terms of HPD, uh, but I would love to hear from you about the partnership with DHS as we phase out these cluster housing and turn them back to affordable housing permanent units. Thank you so much, um, council member, for your partnership and, and for this question. So I will start with clusters. We closed two phases um, already of the clusters program. This administration has committed to ending the clusters program. And so we have been working with our partners at um, HRA and DHS to do, to do just that. So we have already purchased two sites um, for a total of 721 units in phase one, 225 units in phase two. We're now currently working on phase three and our target is to try to have that completed in the spring. This is 779 units and we're simultaneously working on phase four which is 328 units. So while we are, it's, it's the same lawyer uh, for both phase three and four. And so we are actively working to close one. Time has expired. On the other. In terms of uh, CLTs, yes, we've hired a dedicated person um, to work on CLTs with um, our partners at Enterprise and our advocates as uh, we're so proud that we were able to um, grow the capacity of CLTs in this city um, in order to take on more CLT work that we're, we're, we're um, thankful that we were able to preserve two um, CLT projects, one um, being Cooper Square, and that we continue to refine the issues with our partners to, to basically grow that tool in our, um, in our toolbox. I think we had a, another question from from the council member. It was on the state budget the and, uh, yes. and state budget, Parts. landlord ambassadors. So landlord ambassadors, thank you so much for the funding to help keep that program going. We really, really appreciate it. And thank you for helping us extend the CLT deadline, by the way, um, uh, sorry, the, the basements deadline for homeowners to apply. I wanted to say that as well, because that's another part of um, homeownership. But this landlord, um, Ambassador's program is going exceedingly well. It is a crucial part of the work we do, and it's going to continue to be a crucial part of our homeownership work. And so with our homeownership work with the Center for New York City Neighborhoods, especially with the expansion of the help desk, um, especially with the rental subsidies, for example, you know, for the small homeowners who have renters who will need access to the new um, rental subsidies that the state and the city are going to be putting out, um, you know, the landlord ambassadors is going to be crucial to that work. In terms of money from the state, um, we continue to ask and we continue to ask for more every year. And so far our relationship um, with HCR is such that they have been generous and um, we have gotten the, the amounts that we need. We still need to advocate on the federal side for um, a reduction in what's called the 50% test where we can use the bonds for more projects, right? So if they reduce that test from saying you have to use 50% of the funds in a, in a project has to be spent um, 
using the, the, the credits and the bonds, if they reduce that to something to 25, we can spread those bonds and credits over more projects. So our collaboration with the state has been great, but there's only a finite resource and we need to be able to stretch that resource. So we need the federal government to, be, to change those rules. Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner. I look forward to working with you. We'll have a conversation offline about yes. ownership opportunities, but thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. We will now have a second round of questions uh, from Council Member Chen, followed by Council Member Moya. Your time will begin now. Thank you. Um, I really wanted to thank your team uh, for the two projects in my district, um, the senior project and the and, um, and the, the Go Room project. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the state proposal, right? Um, they're talking about allowing conversions of hotels and office space um, into um, housing, residential, but only with 20% allocated for affordable housing. I want us to hear your opinion about that. And also, is HPD also looking at this possibility of converting uh, some of the, the vacant uh, residential build, uh, vacant office building and hotel because of the pandemic into permanent affordable housing and supportive housing um, in the city. And also is there, um, how is the acquisition fund? Is there a possibility of increasing the capital budget in terms of acquisition so that HPD can work with nonprofit organization to acquire some of the distressed building and convert them into affordable housing? I, I thank you, Council Member. I so appreciate that question. Um, we, we think the state um, bills are a, a solution looking for a problem, really, um, that <laughs> we, we oppose um, this legislation. We believe that when um, the state should not override city zoning, that when we change zoning in the city, we go to the community, we go to the elected officials, we plan for what is best for an area and how we like the city to look and to be and to grow. And that's why when we did the mandatory inclusionary housing program, we went to the community boards, we went to the borough president, we mm -hmm. came to you in the council, and we all agree about where um, the city should go and what should be zoned and what should. So uh, just as a matter of- Time has expired. Um, we disagree with that. Uh, on the mm -hmm. other hand, the city has a lot of experience in converting and buying hotels. We just um, financed 90 Sands, which was a Jehovah's Witness hotel in Brooklyn. And we just, we acquired the site with a not-for-profit and we just financed the rehab for the site in December. We constantly look at proposals for hotels from, from the community and we request them habitually because we, like everyone else, would be happy to purchase buildings at the right price in order to develop affordable housing. What we're seeing is that the hotels people are bringing to us are so expensive. They are yeah. as expensive as our new construction supportive housing projects. And so we're, we're ready to do something in that space. And we're constantly refining with DHS and HRA, which has a 30 year master lease program that we may be able to use. HDC may be able to do 501c3 bonds in order to do it. But the price has to be something that makes sense. And it's not making sense compared to the, the the projects that we're doing now. And so, you know, we, and, and what, what I said, it's looking for a problem is that we don't have a problem buying hotels. We have a problem finding hotels that are cost effective. And what we think is gonna happen is if you have a hotel or a building that is obsolete, that is not useful, the price should go down, right? Because the highest and best use is not there. But if you go and put a zoning overlay to hand them a highest and best use, what yeah. you've actually done is increase the price and our not-for-profits are not able to acquire that site anymore. We also have the pillars program, which we put into mm -hmm. effect just for that purpose. In terms of the acquisition fund, it is a $210 million fund and we repurposed it so that it is solely for MWBs and not-for-profits in the past 
for-profit developers used to have access to this fund. It was created to help affordable housing developers compete in the market. We don't think the for-profit folks need that help anymore. Mm -hmm. The MWBs do and the not-for-profits do. And so we said only MWBs and not-for-profits, if they have at least 51% stake in a, in, a, in a deal, they can access this. So um, if there is no issue with either a not-for-profit or an MWB being able to acquire the sites, the thing is the cost. People still don't believe that the market is bad enough for them to reduce their prices. And we think that state bill is going to make that price increase even worse. Okay, so then is the administration working with the council to advocate against that bill? I mean, I think we should, if it's really not good for the city, not good for our community, we should work together uh, to make sure sure that our state elected hear from us and not create more problem for us in the city. Um, thank you. I've been, I've been asked to make calls and I have made calls, but um, we will talk to our partners in City Hall. I think with the other thing with the acquisition fund is also um, there are, you know, distressed buildings um, in, the, in the community um, that nonprofit can be utilize that money to renovate and, and to purchase the building to keep it uh, as a permanent affordable. And the other issue with the hotel is that DHS is uh, renting all these hotels and the city's doing that um, for homeless shelter. So in some ways, they, is there any kind of coordination with HPD? Like some of the, the, the hotel that the city is spending so much money on um, using it for, you know, homeless shelter, I mean, those could be turned into supportive housing or permanent affordable housing by pulling the resources together. Uh, you know, thank you, Councilman, but we work really closely with DHS. Um, uh, you know, again, it's the, the price of purchase outright um, and how we can put sources together and what's most cost effective. And so, we they they have a new master lease program i'm sure you're going to hear more from them when they do their testimony um all of that is to say we all three agencies hpd hdc and um, hra are constantly sending numbers back and forth trying to figure out how we can play in this market and we need the prices to drop mm -hmm. okay well thank you thank you commissioner Thank you, Chair. We will next hear from Council Member Moya and then circle back to Chairs Cornegie and Rosenthal for their final questions. Thank you. Good time will begin. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, this was my second question. Um, it, it deals with a policy paper um, that HPD released on housing segregation called um, Where We Live. Um, you know, given the spread of COVID in overcrowded neighborhoods like mine uh, in Corona, Queens, where affordable housing is almost non existent. Uh, we have cramped multi-generational households here. Uh, what are you focusing on to implement changes needed uh, to desegregate the city, especially given the uh, public health need uh, to do so uh, right now? Thank you so much, um, council member, for this excellent question. And so, you know, the goals of where we live, uh, by the way, I just, I want to give a shout out to NYCHA and to HPD and all of the agencies, the Department of Education, everybody who worked on this, the, the council, the, the advocates um, who put together after two years um, this amazing study uh, to, to end um, discrimination in housing and in many other parts of the city. So we, you know, part of our plan is to create affordable housing um, as inexpensively as possible in all of the five boroughs. <laughs> and, um, you know, we have tried, we use many different tools to do that. In one of them is rezoning through MIH. Um, but, you know, they, what we'd like to do in the future is to unlock the ability in more places to be able to produce housing. So um, where, there are restrictions on um, creating more than a two-family home. You know, could we have a three-family home, right? Where there are parking restrictions that 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 um, that don't allow that. Can we talk about what that looks like? 
Um, can we have, uh, you know, more rental assistance so we can put affordable housing in amenity rich neighborhoods, right? So in neighborhoods that um, have schools and housing, you know, how can we use our section eight to move people who want to move into these amenity rich neighborhoods to be there? Um, how do we uh, look at combating persistent discrimination in the housing market? Right? How do we test? How we do we do a lot of testing in order to see that landlords and brokers aren't turning people away because they're not the right people for their buildings? So, um, in terms of where we live, we're looking at you know even our the types of housing that we're creating in these neighborhoods right so um what what are we uh, having um folks live in you know the housing should be a place now um post in pandemic that you can spend 24 hours so what you know where do you is there outdoor space is there um good light and air is there good ventilation is there broadband um people in affordable housing need the same kind of um, services and amenities that other people don't think about, right? And so do you have good connectivity so your child can actually um, do remote learning that the, the, um, someone can work from home? Do we have um, the right um, banks and grocery stores and other things that make um, living in a neighborhood easy and comfortable. So th these are the sort of things that we um, are working towards. And as part of our um, recent launch of our new design guidelines, we took those things into account to say that when we create affordable housing, we have to have the best um, materials that are available that, that contribute to cooling, that when we create affordable housing, that we have to ensure that place, um, buildings that are not near a park have the right open space, whether it be rooftop space or other space that they could live um, in comfortably in their homes. Um, so it, this is uh, just a little bit of what we're trying to do with where we live. Um, and we were happy to talk further about more, more of the goals for the future. Yeah, and I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about that um, moving forward, because this is an important piece. I think if we are looking to uh, really uh, take a holistic look at what is happening here in the city of New York in terms of a housing crisis, in terms of gentrification, um, this is a plan that really needs to be implemented uh, the right way. Um, while we do neighborhood rezoning so that there is not that displacement uh, that we're seeing throughout the city. Um, so I'd love the opportunity, um, uh, Commissioner, to, to have a further discussion with you uh, and your team on this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Chairs. Next up, we have questions from Chair Rosenthal. Your time will begin now. Uh, Great. Thank you uh, so much. Really appreciate that. Um, and thank you, Commissioner, for having the time to stay for a second round of questions. Um, I have some really sort of basic lay questions um, because, you know, the world of real estate finance is a technical one. And um, I know there are a lot of rules and hurdles and words that you use to actually get things done. But um, let me just ask some sort of um, basic sort of question. And, and Council Member Chin touched on this as well. So at a time when everyone seems to be talking about the fear of predity, predatory equity sharks going in and you know swooping in and buying all these homes and then you know for a dime and then renovating and selling them for a fortune, is there a role for the city? to do obviously not predatory, but do two things. One, let folks know that if they're being approached by predatory equity sharks, that they should instead come to the city who could perhaps help them refinance. Or number two, for homes that have, or, you know, yeah, for homes that are abandoned, you know, where the city 
could swoop in and um, purchase or do a financing deal uh, for some of the constituents that Chair Carnegie is talking about, who um, people who are desperate for home ownership. Uh, thank you so much for that question. And and yes, um, so you know the city has partnered in the in the last crisis, two thousand and eight. The city partnered with the Center for New York City Neighborhoods, and we work with them um, extensively to help. Uh, prevent foreclosure and um, to combat deed theft and, and scams. And so um, we launched the homeowner help desk with that in mind, and we're expanding it, as I said before, to Southeast Queens, Central Brooklyn, North Bronx. And really, we would like that to be citywide. And we would like it to become a household name. Um, we're trying to work on a campaign now so that folks know when people are getting so much information coming at them, how do you know who is a legitimate source and who isn't? And we want the homeowner help desk to be that first point of contact where the Center for New York City Neighborhoods can talk to a homeowner that's struggling um, or having issues that need advice where they can help um, re help refinance and recapitalize loans so that they are something that the the, um, the homeowner can afford. We at HPD have been um, in conjunction with uh, Chair Carnegie as part of the working group that we are on, have been um, designing a homeowner, an office of home ownership. Mm -hmm. uh, we believe that HPD with the center has a strong role to play um, where we'd like to change our relationship with homeowners whereby they can come to our office of homeownership and they can get advice as to which of our programs work for them, whether they should be talking to the center or whether we're the right place for them to be. And so we are continually revi um, revising what that would look like. Um, we think there should be a lot of cease and desist zones in the city. And you know we advocate for whether it's at the state level, creating those zones in places that we know there's a lot of predatory um, action. Um, the, the Landlord Ambassadors Program is another effort of ours to help struggling homeowners where we're, um, we're looking at the tax lien sale um, information yeah, yeah. and we're picking yeah. properties and encouraging them to come in and talk to us. We're trying to have this thought of the whole office of homeownership to be a holistic place where all of that lives and where we're able to strengthen our abilities. We also have, um, we work with Manny and with um, other partners to buy um, distressed debt so that we, that we can acquire that debt and try to help um, struggling homeowners rather than have a predatory purchaser purchase that debt. And so um, you're right. I think we have a lot of efforts going at the same time, um, in, including our CLT program, then we're and expanding the base of CLTs that are able to help us. But we believe that if we create that office of ownership where that is a constant thing that they're charged with thinking about and working on, we can have that central place at HVD. I guess I love your answer and it's so thorough um, so obviously you're hitting on all the points. I'm wondering in terms of um, the hiring freeze, how the mayor thinks about a sense of urgency for what you're talking about, given that, you know, again, I am a lay person, but I read the newspaper and, you know, having and setting up an office is great, but this is happening now. Do you know what I mean? I missed it. Um, so, you know, uh, this team at HPD has proven to be nimble and to be able to do, um, do what is necessary to meet this crisis. 
So in fact, um, our, and I, I've let you hear from Kim Dogger, our Associate Commissioner for um, Preservation Finance, we're trying to repurpose a team in our Preservation Finance Department in order to do that. And so, um, you know, we, we, and also we're, at, we're advocating for funds from Enterprise, from the Attorney General's Office, who has also recently helped with funding. And so we're looking to other sources as well, not just sure, sure. funding. For sure. I'm sure everyone at OMB loves what you're saying right now. <laughs> Are, is there anyone doing that activity today? Uh, yes. And so I would love for you to hear from um, Associate Commissioner Kim Darga. Um, so she can tell you more about it, but really it's taking people we already have and restructuring a team. And so maybe she can better answer this, but I'm wondering how many people or families we're talking about there, and if any are in Chair Carnegie's district. <laughs> like, so so yeah. Kim, would you like to talk a sure. little bit more about your work? Thanks. Sure, thank you, council member, and thank you, commissioner. Um, so as our commissioner said, we do have uh, extensive resources today, and I think one of our challenges is that they've been planted in parts of the agency, and so it hasn't really been a, a, a cohesive strategy. That's something that we've really tried to change in the last few years. Um, so there are two main uh, kind of sets of initiatives that we've really tried to move forward, particularly the last three or four years. Um, on the uh, for smaller... I'm gonna beg, I'm really gonna sure. apologize for this only because we're all on the clock. I'm really just talking about during the pandemic. That, that's all I'm interested in is, you know, this, this very direct question of today, there are predity, predatory Ecuador sharks who are out there scooping up properties. And I am wondering just very simply is HPD in there too? Uh, do you have all the resources you need to get in there? And um, because everyone always says to me, why isn't the city taking this opportunity to do more for affordable housing at a time when the floodgates seem to be open to predatory equity sharks? Sure. So we do have extensive resources. Um, we've put them in place the last few years and they have been available during the pandemic. The two, th one thing that we have particularly tried to expand uh, in the last year and I think is especially important at this time uh, are the resources to support vulnerable homeowners. So specifically, I think some of the concerns that Council Member Cornegie um, flagged um, for you know challenges in his district. Um, we, as the commissioner mentioned, we expanded and launched this homeowner help desk. Um, we also launched Home Fix uh, a little over a year ago now, and right. we've gotten more than um, two thousand expressions of interest from homeowners, and we're working through those applications now. So, no. so starting fiscal year twenty one. Mm -hmm using all these different tools, amazing tools, and understanding that there are stages. You know, as you just said, expression of interest is probably the first phase. And technically there are probably three or four phases in between to home ownership or saving a property of some sort. How many, I guess, have been, how many expressions of interest have you heard between all of this? And at the end of the day, how many have you closed on? Sure. So um, we opened up the program Home Fix for Expressions of Interest a little over a year ago now. Um, and the pandemic really slowed down um, the scoping of properties. Uh, at this point, there are more, fi more than 500 up, um, eligible homeowners that have been screened. And they are working on applications with our partners. And there are over 60 homeowners that have had scopes done and the first loans are expected to close this month. Awesome. So they are actively, um, right. our partners are actively working with homeowners to secure those resources. What the demand is out there? In terms of uh, access for home repair and counseling. Um, 
that I, and I'm not sure that we can really answer that question other than the fact that we do have thousands of homeowners that have reached out seeking assistance through programs like the help desk through home fix and through the work that we've done for over a decade now with um, our partner organizations like the Center for New York City Neighborhoods. Right, I think I got lost in my own questioning. I meant to be talking about people who might be at risk of losing their mortgage, losing their home. Are we talking about the same group of people? Yes, okay. Um, and um, if I may, council member, so just if you look at East New York, where we um, had our first home and help desk, we had conducted outreach to over 3,000 homeowners. We hosted 12 different outreach events. We educated about 2,000 homeowners. We assisted 350 of them with foreclosure prevention, financial and legal counseling. And that's the kind of thing we hope to expand throughout the city. So as we expand the help desk um, to in, in each neighborhood, we expect that we will be doing that foreclosure counseling prevention, that sort of education, that it will become a more of a household name that people will know to come to us and the center as opposed to anywhere else. So could I ask you just once again, you ran through those numbers that were so brilliant so quickly. Um, so you started with, there were 12 outreach sessions. Um, there was outreach to about 3,500 homeowners. Um, we held education, um, educational events for about 2,000 of them. We assisted about 350 um, with foreclosure prevention, financial and legal counseling. And we want to replicate that throughout the city. So now we've expanded into those other neighborhoods, okay. but have um, sorry. Can I just ask, so it went from 3,500 to 2,000 that actually sought the education and then 350 of those, so 10% of the original um, benefited from this. Do you, do you have ideas about why the other uh, 1,650 did not? Um, I can't answer that today, um, but I will and, happy to, to get back. Yeah, I mean, I think part of my part of my question is, do you need more resources, <laughs> right? Like if you had more people on hand to follow up on those, would we be able to reach these other 1,600 families that, you know, are desperate? Um, and with that, Thank you very, very much. But I, I want to shift just a little bit with that to the ANHD report that recently came out. And they, I could get the name of it. Hang on. Um, the Gaping Holes in New York Safety Net is the name of the report. And what's really interesting is they lay out three different possible, three different scenarios of families and what they're facing. And they list out all their revenue pre-pandemic and what their expenses were, they were just at zero, fine. But then post-pandemic sort of, you know, not having jobs, but getting benefits, not having jobs, but getting that $2,400 stimulus check, sort of where everyone stands. And it was fantastic. I mean, it was really great eye-opener with, with very specific examples that that were helpful and i'm wondering if your office can get a bead on um i know this is ridiculous so i'm but i'm just i have to ask um sort of how many of each of the different scenarios there are out there and what's the cost of that and the reason i ask is because i'm so fascinated by this idea of cancel rent and I don't exactly know what that means because there are the people who own the buildings and we work with about 30 small property owners in our district, they have mortgages to pay. Like, so I'm just trying to understand like how the, how the math works. So are people in cancel rent saying, well then just, uh, you know, as long as the federal government, you know, takes away mortgage, payment need or covers the cost of mortgage payments and taxes, then 
you know, home, homeowners wouldn't have the biggest need to charge so much in rent. Like I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around it and I feel like your office probably has tools to understand it much better than I do. So, you know, thank you, Council Member. I, I, for, for that excellent question, you know, um, we're interested in, you know, the, the Foreman Center did a study that showed that, um, you know, the folks that are most likely to have, to be in service jobs that may have lost a job during the pandemic live in buildings that are under 20 units, but mostly in buildings that are one to five. Right. Um, throughout the pandemic, um, I have been on many different town halls with um, different electeds. And I've heard from a lot of, you know, immigrants and folks who have, who are owner occupied buildings where they've said that um, the, the tenants can't pay and, and they have good long-term tenants that they love, but then that means they can't live or eat either, right? And so yeah, yeah. Our, um, our emphasis is in making sure that people can afford to pay their rent. And, by, and the way we go about that has been one, this amazing affordable housing plan you know, making sure that this year over 60% of our housing was for people make families earning less than $52,000 and half of that was for families earning less than $31,000. So we need to produce more housing that people can actually afford uh, is, is one. And the other is we need to have the right rental subsidies. And, you know, when we advocated throughout the, the um, pandemic, you know, for more Section 8, um, so that, and, and different kind of Section 8, a six month program and a two year program, because all what that does is it gives people breathing room, right? People don't always need permanent assistance. Um, the New Yorkers are hardworking people, but there are times when you've got a hit like the pandemic and you need six months assistance, right? And another family might need a two year assistance. So that that's what the A and H the report lays out. Exactly, and so the idea is not um, to deprive uh, people of the ability to pay the porters and to pay the service people that also need jobs, or to to deprive the 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 immigrant who has saved up and and now has an owner owner occupied building, and suddenly you know they 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 themselves are facing. Um, eviction and homelessness, that, that, that our idea is that we, we build the right type of housing that people can afford. And, I, and, and um, in other instances, we have the right types of rental subsidy, right? Because it, it's, a, it's a one size rental subsidy and that does not suit everybody. Sometimes a family needs a short term and, a family, and other times a family needs a longer term and then they're off that subsidy a lot of times you know with our section 8 we see attrition right so a family um when people make enough money and they don't need our section 8 anymore we take it away and we give it to somebody else and so expanding that pool and we beg the federal government to really expand how much section 8 we can give and to increase the cap Right, so they artificially cap what we can give out, and even if right. we have reserves, they don't let us use it. Right, um, you know, I know that DHS has um, the one shots that they give out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we, I was waiting for you to say that. <laughs> I'll ask Dave. Don't get me wrong. I'm going to ask him the same question. Um, um, and, and so, you know. We've been working with DHS and with MOPT to say, look, you don't have to be have an eviction eminent for you to be able to apply for a one shot. If you if you um, behind on your rent, you should be able to just apply for one shot. And DHS has changed that for the city portion, but for the state portion, they haven't been able to get that approval to do that, right? And so the whole thing is challenging, no <laughs> doubt. I'm going to ask one last question because I see my colleagues have their hands raised and I just want to make sure that this gets asked. Um, the emergency repair program, 
I don't think anyone's touched on that yet and the alternative enforcement program. Um, I'm wondering, I guess the city's preliminary budget city funds of 700,000 to cover projected expenses related to emergency repair work for buildings located in the 100 year floodplain. Can HPD provide an estimate of how many buildings are currently in the 100 year floodplain and why these repairs may or may not be eligible for the federal community development block grant funds? Um, and what's the total city funded portion for repairs in this subset of buildings and has this figure increased over years? Thank you so, so much. Just a simple yes, no. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much, Council Member. Um, so we had about um, uh, uh, 71,500 residential buildings in the 100-year flood, um, flood plain. Say that again, 7,500? 75,500. Got it. And, um, you know, mo in order for us to use federal funds uh, for repair costs on these buildings, um, it requires that the homeowner has flood insurance. And most of the homeowners don't have flood insurance. And so that's why we're not able to use federal funds here. Um, it's the reason why we're having to, having to use um, city capital. The total city fund, funds for, um, for repairs in this program has increased over the years um, to about $700,000 Per year, um, while expenses have and the expenses have re been really r consistent over the years, um, you know, we 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 have financed about three hundred and eighty-five of those buildings um, through uh, between twenty twenty you know, twenty fourteen and twenty twenty. Um, and we continue to need to support um, these owners um, if they don't have the right insurance to use federal funding. Well, that's rough. I mean, I'm just stating the obvious. That's rough. I mean, it's such a, you know, I mean, it's rough. It's a tiny portion of what the demand could be. Um, great. Well, I really appreciate your patience and, and answering my questions. I really appreciate it. I appreciate my colleagues' patience as well. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Councilman. All right. Uh, we'll turn to any questions from Chair Cornegy and then turn to Council Member Barron for a second round of questioning. If Chair Cornegy has stepped away, Council Member Barron, you can get started. Uh, thank you. Thank you to uh, Chair Rosenthal, who's here. Just a few brief points. When you cited the assistance that HPD had offered, did I hear you say that that was in East New York? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, I did. I just want to. I just want to make note of the fact that, uh, as the representative for East New York, I've been very conscious about trying to assist homeowners and trying to make sure that they can get uh, as much information as possible. And uh, when I, whenever people talk about the assistance that's given to the residents and homeowners to try to make sure that they don't lose their homes, I have to mention the name of Mr. Melvin Faulkner, who recently passed, but who worked with over, he was in my office when I was in the assembly. And we had approximately a hundred odd families and they came to our office for assistance and we were able to give them assistance. And not one of those persons who came lost their homes So he was very dedicated. So I just have to give him that honor and that recognition. In terms of the HP, in terms of the pilot program for basement conversion, basement legalization conversions, uh, there was a pause on that and we've been told that uh, we can't extend the program beyond those homeowners who were designated. Uh, I think it was 19, I'm not precise with that number, uh, but we need to make sure that as this program 
now has been given an extension to move forward that we assist all of those homeowners to get the assistance and file the paperwork and move forward in that. So if you might just want to talk briefly about that program. Thank you so much, uh, council member, and thank you so much to the council for extending the timeline for um, the homeowners to be able to file their documents at, at DOB. We really appreciate that. Um, as, you, as you know, when we started the pilot program, we reached out to about 8,000 um, homeowners. Um, that number went down to about 100 households where we did detailed home assessments, um, work to see what, whether they were eligible. There are now nine homeowners who are participating. Um, I thought it was 19. No, oh, it's nine. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's nine homeowners um, who are now eligible. At the, the, um, and we'll come to the lessons we've learned from the pilot uh, as to why it's nine in a, in a minute. But there are nine homeowners who are now proceeding. We are working diligently with them um, we're to secure about to get through all of their DOB um, processes. We're working with Cypress Hills, our partner, and we expect um, the funding to, to happen for these nine homeowners and to happen in, in short order. So these nine homeowners are going to move forward. The lessons we learned, council member, is that um, a detached house is uh, better than a semi-detached semi -detached or an attached home. Um, if semi-detached and attached homes make it really, really difficult to do the basement work. Um, what we also learned was um, there's a height requirement by the, right. the fire department. Right. Uh, and I've been told that you need a certain height in cubic feet for, because if there's a fire and there's smoke right. um, to avoid suffocation and so what we found is when we tried to do Time has expired. assessments, um, some areas, would, some homes would need a digging down into the foundation to dig deeper in order to create that height. And uh, so a lot of people dropped out from eligibility for that reason. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then the, you know, the, you know, all of this, the parking and requirements. So we have some work to do, but we really, really love this program and we want it to be citywide. So we're going to keep working on it, but those nine homeowners will get their funding. Okay, great. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. All right, uh, now we'll turn to any final questions from Chair Cornegie, if you have any, and then take public testimony. Just to close out effectively, uh, the COVID-19 Emergency Eviction and Foreclosure Prevention Act also placed a moratorium on residential foreclosure proceedings until May 1st. Homeowners and small landlords who own buildings with 10 or less units can file hardship declarations with their mortgage lender other foreclosure party or a court that would prevent a foreclosure. Is HPD tracking the number of homeowners who are behind on their mortgages due to issues related to the pandemic? And what is HPD's role and or responsibility with respect to assisting these small landlords? Thank you, um, council member for that question. So um, we have, HPD it, um, does not track homeowner and um, the, the mortgage defaults, except in terms of the work that we're doing with the Center for New York City Neighborhoods to support homeowners. So when they are at the front lines of trying to bring homeowners in to help prevent foreclosure and to counsel homeowners, the way we've been tracking the homeownership problem is from the renter side, right? Especially from where you have homeowners that have renters, right? And then and they have issues paying their mortgage because the renters don't have the, the ability to pay rent. So right now we're tracking the homeownership issue through um, our work with the center and through the landlord ambassadors program and through the homeowner help desk program. Okay, um, and then lastly, uh, in fiscal 2021 adopted budget, the city council provided about 12.5 million in discretionary funding for citywide housing initiative administered by HPD, including 
foreclosure prevention programs, which received level funding of 3.2 million. Can you provide an update on what type of assistance has been provided to homeowners facing foreclosures this year? And has there been an uptick in program services? Thank you, council member. Um, for and that. I, I just want to say before you answer, that was important to me. I'm on the budget negotiation team and we fought diligently to make sure that um, while we were in a nine, while we were in a $9 billion budget deficit, that we specifically did not cut the money to programs that we knew would assist when the, when the um, moratoriums were lifted, both on foreclosures and on um, evictions. So, I, you know, in plain language, I'm just curious as to how that money was spent in the past and what programs and who was affected by it. Thank you. Thank you so much, council member, for that question. I will, um, I will answer first, and I would also like to ask um, Associate Commissioner Kim Draga to further elaborate. So um, HPD has, uh, with those funds, that we're really thankful for, the, for you and the council for providing to us. We have an, an HPD mortgage buyback community restoration fund. This, we use that fund to acquire distress notes. And um, with that fund, we work with Manny and with Preserving City Neighborhoods, as well as the Center for um, New York City um, Neighborhoods in order to offer mortgage modification to homeowners. And um, when that's not available, um, we, we um, any foreclosed homes that become, we were able to take foreclosed homes and make them affordable housing rentals. Um, in addition, we, with the center, we do targeted outreach throughout the city to homeowners to assist them. Um, we also work with NHS, the New York City neighborhoods to administer project health, as well as home fix and provide additional homes for, um, for, for homeowners in order to keep them afloat. So we're really using that money to buy distressed debt, to convert loans, homes to rentals if they've already been foreclosed on. We're using that money to give with NHS and with the center to give counseling and to give low cost loans. And, um, you know, if I've missed anything, I am going to call my on my associate commissioner, um, Kim Dogger, to further elaborate on how we spent that money. Um, thank you, Commissioner and Council Member. I don't think I have a whole lot to add. I think you covered um, most of it. Um, we are aggressively working with our partners to make sure that um, they are able to successfully use the funding this year and um, we'll do what we can to support them so that we can achieve our mutual goals. So oh wait, so uh, Commissioner Dogger, while I have you, um, can you can you tell me the amount of homeowners that were impacted by that particular program? So was it 10 families, was it 20 families um, that because of that program either had the loan modification done or had you know worked with Manny or whatever the case may be, do we have a number on that? And the only reason I'm asking is because I try to be a good fiscal steward with taxpayers' dollars. And so while I'm in there fighting for programs, um, I, I'd like to know how effective they are, especially in this time. Sure. So the Community Restoration Fund program, uh, so far we have uh, the, the with council support, there have been 62 distressed mortgage notes that have been purchased from mortgage insurers. Um, we uh, were actively actually pursuing additional opportunities uh, this year with, um, with FHA to purchase additional notes, but unfortunately, um, they are not, fortunately, I would say, um, they are not actually doing mortgage sales right now because of the pandemic. Um, and so I do think there's going to be some limited opportunity this year just because of the moratoriums and the restrictions on sales, which is a good thing. Um, we do expect that the need is going to increase once those um, the moratoriums and the restrictions end, and we are actively talking with the insurers to make sure that we are ahead of that and that we um, can seize the moment um, in order to um, help folks that do have uh, delinquent loans uh, potentially qualify for mortgage modifications um, down the road. So just my last question is, is, is there an annual target that you seek and did we reach it in 2020? 
We don't have an annual target so much for this program. Um, it's really that we are looking for opportunities uh, with lenders and the mortgage insurers to purchase distressed notes that exist in New York City. Um, and we will continue to do that with FHA, um, Fannie, uh, Fannie Mae, and Freddie Mac. Um, and we are also talking with lenders directly um, including through um, you know, discussions that we're having about zombie homes. Um, so there are extensive opportunities that we're pursuing and um, we are hope that, you know, that we'll have partners that are willing to sell to us. Thank you. All right, uh, we will now turn to testimony from members of the public. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our in-person council hearings, we'll be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will set the timer and announce that you may begin. Your testimony will be limited to two minutes. We will first hear from Barika Williams, followed by John Baker and Chris Wadello. Barika? Your time will begin now. Hi, how are you? I, I apologize, I'm not Barika. My name is Emily Goldstein. Uh, Barika had to hop to another pre-scheduled meeting so I will instead be, speak on behalf of the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, or ANHD, where I am the Director of Organizing and Advocacy. Uh, ANHD builds community power to win affordable housing and thriving equitable neighborhoods for all New Yorkers. We thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I'll use this time to highlight a few key priorities. There are more details and supporting data available in our written testimony, which we'll submit, uh, as well as on our website. Um, First, we'd like to ask the City Council to work with the state in order to ensure the equitable distribution of the $1.3 billion New York will receive from the December federal relief package. Doing this would in turn support the city's budget for rent relief. A recent ANHD analysis shows how a more proportional allocation method would achieve uh, this distribution. Second, we'd like to ask you to restore $3.65 million in the budget for the Community Housing Preservation Initiative, uh, sometimes still known as HPICCC, including $110,000 of this funding for ANHD to provide the rest of the funded community groups with individualized as well as group technical assistance and capacity building support so that they in turn can do their ground level work as effectively and efficiently as possible. Third, we ask you to continue supporting ANHD dis ANHD's Displacement Alert Project, or DAP, in the coming year with a $100,000 allocation of funding. This is our tool that provides uh, valuable data and research uh, information to both elected officials and organizers and advocates on the ground about the housing uh, needs and, and um situation at a block by block, building by building, as well as district by district level. Finally, we ask you to fully restore funding for the affordable expired. housing capital budget um, so that we can continue to address our city's urgent affordability crisis. Thank you. Thank you. You will now hear from John Baker, followed by Chris Wadello and Deanir Del Rio. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm John Baker. Thank you. Um, I'm John Baker at the Center for New York City Neighborhoods. Uh, I'm, uh, I wanted to thank the, uh, um, the Committee on Housing and Buildings and the Subcommittee on Capital Budget for uh, allowing us to speak. And uh, also I'd like to thank uh, Commissioner Carol at HBD for all the wonderful mention of our work. So I don't have to introduce uh, our work so much in two minutes. Um, uh, what I wanna talk about briefly is, uh, is the uh, warnings we're seeing in the wake of the uh, coronavirus pandemic. It's still ongoing. Um, we are seeing uh, long-term indicators of distress. They're sending dire warning signals of trouble um, coming for working and middle-class homeowners, particularly in communities of color. Uh, as of January, 14% of FHA mortgages are delinquent citywide, which is more than double the national average. The unemployment rate stood at 11.4% as of December, more than triple the rate at the same time in 2019. And according to the census, New York City has the highest foreclosure and eviction risk in the country with nearly 500,000 residents at risk of losing their homes. Uh, fortunately, because of the foreclosure moratoria and the uh, forbearance on mortgages right now, no, uh, very few people are 
actually losing their homes, but we see this as a band-aid masking the crisis to come. By most measures, the risk of home ownership, uh, the homeowners losing their homes is larger than it was in 2008. Uh, Chair Carnegie, you said, I don't want to come out of this pandemic with the same inequities we had before. I I'm unfortunately here to say we're on that path. Uh, also, Chair Rosenthal, you asked if we need more resources to help homeowners uh, at risk from predators, and I'm here to say we do need more resources. Uh, we're re requesting $4 million in city council funding to support our homeowner help desk and our foreclosure prevention efforts, and $3 million to support HomeFix. Both are badly needed to help homeowners in trouble right now. Uh, we thank you very much for your time, and I ask you to read our uh, uh, written testimony for more information. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Chris Wadello, followed by Nero Del Rio and Zuria Fields. Your time will begin now. Great, thank you. Um, my name is Chris Widello. I'm the Director of External Affairs for NISAF, and we're the Trade Association for the Affordable Housing Industry here in New York. Uh, thank you, Chair Carnegie, for the opportunity to testify and to the members of the committee for being here today. Um, it's hard to believe a year ago we were testifying before this uh, committee on this very day. Um, we couldn't have really imagined that everything would be changing so drastically in the, in the, in the year that followed. And you know, we really hope that better times are ahead. Um, and that, uh, you know, as New York City looks to um, emerge from, uh, you know, the, the economic tr troubles that have uh, come upon us due to the pandemic. And we believe that the affordable housing industry can help play a role in that. Uh, we did a study a few years ago and it looks, you know, when you look at a typical 100 unit affordable housing project, New York can, um, you know, you can count on, on about 175 construction jobs, 20 permanent jobs, and about $3. million in sustained local economic activity. And this is why the restoration, the partial rest restoration of $446 million uh, this past October um, that was eliminated in the final budget was so important because that results in tens of thousands of units of affordable housing, um, you know, thousands of construction jobs, hundreds of permanent jobs, and tens of millions of dollars that go into the local economy. So we want to thank you, uh, the administration, the housing committee, and the entire council for the part that they played to make that possible. Um, want to also uh, you know note that in this past year 30,000 affordable homes were produced I mean that's quite impressive especially in this environment um, and you know I think it's really noteworthy uh, the construction workers that were in essential employees during this time that uh, kept the, the building going um, you know we have a, a, an extreme digital divide and you know this has really been shown uh, the light has been shined on it due to the pandemic and I really want to uh, pass along a thanks to HPD, the commissioner and assistant commissioner for the new, new design guidelines that just came out yesterday. Um, these design guidelines by which we Time has expired. Establish, you know, establishes a criteria by which uh, builds will evaluate proposed developments. And this will make sure that the future of our housing stock will be equipped with high speed broadband service, which people need to survive in, in today's world, um, students, people working, looking for jobs. This is really important and monumental. So thank you to all that were involved in this. Um, you know, and lastly, uh, you know, we know that, um, you know, there hopefully will be some stimulus money coming New York City's way in the, in, the, in the near future. And we need to make sure that some of that money is appropriated to the capital budget uh, to support the construction and preservation of affordable housing. We know how important housing is uh, in a, um, or, you know, really uh, is during the pandemic. And so we need to make sure that, um, you know, people are adequately housed and we're happy to uh, be on the front lines to do the work to um, create that housing. So thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Uh, next we'll hear from Danier Del Rio followed by Azuria Fields and Rebecca Sauer. Danier. Your time will begin now. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Chairman Carnegie, um, Subcommittee Chair Rosenthal, and all the members here today. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Deyanira Del Rio. I'm the co-director of New Economy Project, a citywide economic justice organization that works in partnership with grassroots groups throughout the city. Um, one of the areas of work that we are very active in with partners around the city is on community land trusts and social housing. Um, and we wanted to talk a bit about um, the accomplishments that groups around the city uh, have made over the past two years, creating CLTs and expanding existing CLTs 
to preserve permanently affordable housing, as well as commercial and retail space, um, and many other neighborhood needs using the community land trust ownership model. Um, this council has just has broken new ground by funding this uh, CLT education, organizing and outreach work, um, funding in the past uh, since fiscal year 2020, but funding groups again throughout the five boroughs to do this um, deep work. And it's really paid off in just a couple of years. You're gonna hear from some of the neighborhood-based CLTs about some of the progress that they've made um, to date, uh, you know, reaching thousands of tenants and homeowners, engaging community um, stakeholders, including nonprofit developer partners, doing a comprehensive property research to identify sites in their neighborhoods that could be used to create and preserve deeply affordable housing, retail space for local small businesses, and many other needs. Um, there's been also um, several CLTs have incorporated officially. They've created grassroots leadership through steering committees and founding boards. Um, and over the past two years, um, two CLTs have acquired either their first or additional properties with several more in the process of negotiating um, for properties, completing feasibility studies and so on. So it's, uh, there's been just, you know, from a few years ago when there were very few CLTs in the city to today when we have more than 15 that have taken root, um, it's been a tremendous growth. So we're asking for renewal uh, in the fiscal year 22 budget um, of the Community Land Trust Initiative. We are actually seeking to expand the initiative this year to engage two new community land trusts in the initiative, as well as a city, an additional technical assistance provider. Our organization, New Economy Project, is one of um, four citywide organizations that are providing legal and training um, and other support to help the neighborhood-based CLTs build their capacity. Um, we feel like, in, particularly in light of uh, um, COVID and the pandemic, that these community ownership models um, have generated greater support than ever, including through some of the policies that council is considering, such as COPA um, and other bills. And so we, you know, we hope that the council will continue to strengthen the neighborhood-based capacity to really take advantage of these policy changes and opportunities to move more housing and land out of the speculative market and into community control for long-term uh, permanent affordability. Thank you so much. Thank you. We will now hear from Azuria Fields, followed by Rebecca Sauer and Albert Scott. Your time will begin now. Azuria? Just one moment here, I turn to work on unmuting. All right, we will come back to you, Azuria. We're gonna move forward to Rebecca Sauer, followed by Albert Scott. Okay, good afternoon, Chairpersons Carnegie and Rosenthal, and members of the City Council Finance and Housing and Buildings Committees. My name is Rebecca Sauer. I'm the Director of Policy and Planning at the Supportive Housing Network of New York. We're a membership organization representing the nonprofit developers and operators of supportive housing. Following the release of the mayor's preliminary budget in January, we were very encouraged to see HPD's total FY22 capital budget proposed at 1.45 billion, with FY21 budget updated at 1.43 billion. This includes the restoration, which was announced in November of the 466 million that had been cut in the spring. And we're very grateful to the members of the council who helped advocate for that restoration alongside us and other advocates. We are relieved to see there are no significant cuts in the expense budget that would impact supportive housing services. However, we are in danger of not reaping the benefits of this budget if the HPD hiring freeze remains intact and the nonprofit sector is not fully supported. My colleague Tierra Labrada testified on Monday before the Finance and Contracts Committee on the needs of the nonprofit sector. So I'll focus the rest of my testimony on the impact of the HPD hiring freeze. There are dozens of vacancies across HPD's development, preservation and rental assistance administration departments, which are beginning to impact the pace of supportive housing development and move-ins. 
While we truly, truly appreciate the tremendous efforts HPD staff have made throughout the pandemic, allowing for the largest number of supportive housing units ever to be financed in a six month period, there is a tremendous toll to long periods of understaffing and overworking. And because some positions have not seen salary increases in almost a decade, there's a potential that the city could lose even more talented staff with no capacity to fill those vacancies. Even positions that are funded completely by the federal government are being held vacant. The pandemic and its economic impact have shown us that we need to urgently double down on housing production. If the city is to maximize affordable and supportive housing Time development and preservation and expedite the placement of low income and homeless tenants into this housing, the city must lift the hiring freeze. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. We'll now turn to Albert Scott and then we'll circle back to Azuria Fields who will be followed by Hannah Anusha. Albert. It's on oh, thank you. Oh. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Committee Chair Cornegy, Subcommittee Chair Rosenthal, and members of the committee and subcommittee. And thank you for this opportunity to testify today. My name is Albert Scott, and I am the president of the East New York Community Land Trust. Uh, we are a grassroots volunteer and resident led community land trust fighting for community control of land so that what is built on the land meets the needs of low income black and brown people forever. Uh, East New York CLT and 17 partner organizations are part of a citywide uh, community land trust initiative that seeks 1.5 million. It should be 3 million, <laughs> I would say, uh, in city council discretionary funding for fiscal year 2022. We asked the committee to recommend renewed funding for the citywide uh, community land trust initiative. And I just simply want to state that this funding is crucial for communities um, like ours in East New York, black and brown communities. Uh, the community land trust is a source of empowerment, especially this time during a pandemic where there's so much housing and business insecurity and things of that nature. Uh, community land trust we view as a tool for economic and housing justice. And so much work has been done by this volunteer led organization um, within East New York community. And we really, really need your support on those endeavors. So as a result of, the, as a result of that, we would definitely um, seek the funding from, uh, from the uh, city council will be put to great use and our community will truly, truly appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We will now hear from Isoria Field, followed by Hannah Anusha and Caitlin Penner. Isoria. The time will begin now. Good afternoon, Committee Chair Carnegie, Subcommittee Chair Rosenthal, and members of the committee and subcommittees. Thank you all for the opportunity to testify. My name is Isora Field, and I am the Vice President of the East New York Community Land Trust. We are a grassroots volunteer and resident-led CLT that's fighting for community control of the land so that what's built in our community will meet the needs of our community, specifically low-income Black and brown people in perpetuity, not just for ne the next couple years, but in perpetuity. The East New York CLT has partnered with several other CLTs and organizations to seek $1.5 million in city council discretionary funding for fiscal year 2022. And we ask that the committee recommend renewed funding for the citywide initiative for the fiscal year 22 budget. We are relying on you guys and the CLT initiative funding to move our work forward. And we have done so much with the funding so far. In the short year that we've been working together, we have incorporated as a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And this means so much to the East New York community to be able to provide real home ownership opportunities to people who are from the community and have been residing in the community for decades who are currently being priced out. We want people to be able to stay where they've lived their whole lives, raised their families and, and worked for years and years. We want them to be able to afford to stay. We have grown our steering committee to over 25 active members. That doesn't include other members who come and support and participate in various events that we've held throughout the year. 
We've held over 12 virtual community events and six in-person events to educate residents about the community land trust model and to bring them into the CLT movement. This is something that we seek to grow and develop alongside city council and expired. in the city. Thank you guys for your time and your support. Thank you. We will now hear from Hannah Anusha, followed by Caitlin Penner and Phoebe Flaherty. Hannah. Thanks. Good afternoon, council members. Um, my name is Hannah Anusha, and I'm the staff coordinator for the East New York Community Land Trust. Um, and I'm on staff at Cypress Hills Local Development Corporation. And I wanna speak today about the CLT initiative funding and then also funding for the basement apartment conversion pilot program. Um, so to start, um, I'll keep it short, but I mean, as my um, as members of the East New York Community Land Trust have said, we rely on the city council for the CLT initiative funding a lot. We rely on it to move our work forward and we've done so much with this funding. We've way surpassed the scope of work that was laid out, we laid out originally. Um, and we really need the funding so that we can work to actually acquire properties. Um, and bring them into community ownership. Um, so please, please invest in organizing, invest in us, it really works. Um, and so just to speak to the basement apartment conversion pilot program, it was launched, as many of you know, it was launched two years ago in East New York with a commitment of converting 40 basements into formal affordable rental units. The pilot promised to provide low and moderate income homeowners with reliable source of monthly rental income while also creating stable affordable housing. However, as part of the COVID-19 related budget cuts last, last spring, the city eliminated funding for the pilot program. The pilot program has since secured alternative funds, but um, at a scaled back, scaled back level. Um, but it's so vital that the city commits to funding this program for fiscal year 2022. So we're calling on the city to allocate 250,000 for the pilot program so that it can finish this important work. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll hear from Caitlin Penner, followed by Phoebe Flaherty and Nella Pineda Marcon. Caitlin. The time will begin now. Hi, my name is Caitlin Penner and I'm a member of the East New York Community Land Trust Steering Committee and an advocate for affordable and social housing. The East New York Community Land Trust and 17 other partner organizations are part of a citywide community land trust initiative that seeks at least $1.51 million in city council discretionary funding in fiscal year 2022 to develop CLTs in all five boroughs of New York City. CLTs like the East New York Community Land Trust have worked so hard to develop and preserve deeply affordable housing and community spaces in our neighborhoods by placing rental housing, limited equity cooperatives, and even one to four family homes at risk of foreclosure in the stewardship of local communities and not in the hands of wealthy developers. In the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, when millions of families, the majority of whom are black, brown, or immigrant, have been unable to pay their rent or housing costs due to high housing costs and an inability to work, CLTs have an especially critical role to play in our city's approach to affordable housing. After the COVID-19 pandemic, rents across the city will likely once again begin to arise and families across our city will begin to face evictions and foreclosures as moratoriums begin to run out. Financing the efforts of community land trusts will support ensuring that these families stay housed and will support organizers in black and brown communities like East New York, Cypress Hills, and Brownsville. I've had the honor of working with some incredible organizers in East New York, such as Albert Scott, Miss Deborah Ack, Miss Ethel Cooks, and Miss Isoria Fields, many of whom you'll hear from today, who have spent years fighting to bring deeply affordable housing, commercial, and community spaces to their neighborhoods. Fully funding our efforts will allow organizations like the East New York Community Land Trust to really bring this important vision surrounding community planning, participatory visioning, and breaking ground on new developments toward in working class black and brown communities forward. In additionally, 
Funding CLTs will also work to stabilize housing, combat speculation, and ensure a just recovery in I'm Black, Brown, inspired. and immigrant neighborhoods in our a vital goal for our city in the coming years. We ask the committee to recommend renewed or increased funding for the citywide CLT initiative in the fiscal year 2022 budget. And thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Next we'll hear from uh, Phoebe Flaherty followed by Nella Pineda Marcone and Christy Ortiz Lamb. Phoebe. The time will begin now. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to testify. My name is Phoebe Flaherty. I'm an organizer at Align, the Alliance for Greater New York. Um, we coordinate Climate Works for All Coalition and uh, Transform Don't Trash Coalitions. Um, and as we all know, we're still in the midst of the pandemic where New York's BIPOC and environmental justice communities are bearing the brunt of the impact of the virus and economic downturn. We're seeing record high unemployment concentrated in these communities. So our city's budget must prioritize investment in job creation for communities that have been hit the hardest by the pandemic. Uh, our coalition, the Climate Works for All Coalition has created the Equitable Recovery Report, a roadmap to creating 100,000 good green jobs for New York City's black and brown communities, moving us out of the pandemic and recession towards our climate goals by investing $16 billion over three years. This is a comprehensive plan. We need to move our city through the crisis towards equity and climate justice. However, we know we're still reeling from the crisis and we've developed interim climate budget priorities, which will lead us on the same path towards investment in communities and green job creation while acknowledging the reality of our budget constraints. Within the city's 2022 budget, we're calling for an investment of 80 million to retrofit public schools and 100 million to install solar on public schools. Um, as of 2019, more than a thousand schools um, are emitting at levels beyond local law 97's 20. 30 to 2034 compliance period. And the average cost of 755 per square foot to retrofit buildings, the city would need over a billion dollars throughout the next 13 years to meet the emission targets. That is the city needs to about 80 million every year to retrofit schools to meet these emission standards. Um, research shows that building retrofits uh, with this level of investment will create 482 good union jobs this year with that investment. <clears throat> In 2014, New York committed to installing 100 megawatts of solar energy on schools by the end of 2025. An immediate investment of 100 million towards DCAS's solar program will provide the capacity and resources uh, that it needs to swiftly meet the city's 2025 solar goals. And at completion, um, Time has expired. the savings from these sites will be equivalent to taking uh, thousands of cars off the streets every year and create 500 jobs this year. So we're asking for these investments among others from the Climate Works for All Committee and I'll submit written comments as well that detail these asks. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Nella Pineda Marcon, followed by Christy Ortiz Lam and Lyric Thompson. The time will begin now. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nella Pineda Marcon, and I was, work as a nurse at Mount Sinai, Morningside, and Mount Sinai West. I am also a proud union member of the New York State Nurses Association. I serve as a director at large and chair of our Climate Justice and Re Disaster Relief Committee. NISNA represents 43,000 nurses across New York State, including 25,000 nurses in New York City. This includes nurses in all the city's public hospitals. As nurses in the front lines of patient care, we have seen up close the horrors of the COVID-19 pandemic. Almost 30,000 people in New York City have died and have countless others have been left wounded physically and emotionally. We have seen the deep impact that the pandemic has had on low income communities of color. The disparities are all encompassing, affecting marginalized communities physically, mentally, and economically. We know that this is just a preview of what lay ahead if we do not take climate change seriously. It is critical that we heed the warning. In fact, we have already, already seen the destruction that climate change and environmental degradation has had on the health of our patients. Increases in heat have contributed to an increase in hypertension. Pollutants that are being discharged into our city air and are causing steady increase in 
chronic asthma conditions in our most vulnerable communities. In addition, these communities also face environmental injustices like contaminated water supplies and tainted soil. They are also the ones that are usually hit the hardest by catastrophic events, such as Superstorm Sandy. Time has expired. This is not okay. Please finish, please finish your statement. Let me be clear. The New York State Nurses Association is 100% in support of a fossil fuel free city. We should be doing everything that we can, we can to speed the reality along. The victories we got signed into law with the Climate Mobilization Act and law, Local Law 97 are amazing. But if the funding implementation and accountability is not in place, then the legislation doesn't really matter. We need to move ahead quickly like our house is on fire because it is. We are proud members of the Climate Works for All Coalition, a coalition of unions, climate and environmental justice organization and advocacy groups. We fully endorse the equitable recovery report that came out of this coalition. The report is a longer term plan for creating 100,000 good green jobs over the next three years in New York City's black and brown communities. This is a comprehensive plan that will require $16 billion. We know that the city is hurting financially right now. So we have scaled back on what we are asking for in, in the city's um, 2022 budget. These asks will still work towards our shared goals and strengthen the lives, lives of, our, of our patients and their communities. So what are we asking for? $80 million to retrofit public schools, $100 million to put solar on public schools, $17 million towards public waste management. This includes $4 million to staff the commercial waste zones program and $13 million towards expanding the composting program and 3 million towards clean transportation electric school buses. I thank you for your time and consideration today. Thank you. You will now hear from Christy Ortiz Lamb, followed by Lyric Thompson and Pablo Estupinian. We'll begin now. Good afternoon. I'm Christy Ortiz Lamb, Deputy Director of Brooklyn A's Preserving Affordable Housing Program. Thank you for the opportunity to address the committee. Uh, Brooklyn Legal Services Corp A, um, its mission is to advance social and economic justice and community empowerment through innovative, collaborative, neighborhood-based legal representation and advocacy. Our clients live in rapidly gentrifying neighborhoods throughout New York City, where many residents and small business owners have been displaced or are facing displacement and harassment. As you know, many low income New Yorkers have lost or experienced a decrease in income related due to COVID shutdowns, making it hard or impossible to pay rent or mortgages. The pandemic and the, and the affordable housing crisis has compounded to exasperate the difficulties faced by low to moderate income individuals and families throughout New York City, particularly BIPOC families. Um, Brooklyn A is on the front lines responding to the needs of New Yorkers as we survive and recover from this crisis. We are preparing our community members for the coming lifts of the eviction foreclosure moratoriums so that, that they will be able to stay safely in their homes. So foundations of stability that are even more important as we continue to navigate economic and public health crisis. For homeowners in danger of foreclosure, BKA is representing homeowners in legal proceedings to prevent foreclosures, educating homeowners on their rights and responsibilities concerning moratoriums and reliefs available for financial hardship, and assisting homeowners to apply for bankruptcy as a tool to stop foreclosure process. For tenants in danger of eviction, we are providing legal advocacy to prevent illegal evictions and harassments, and advocating for repairs and restoration of essential services through e-filing and virtual court appearances, administering virtual workshops on tenant rights and education, organizing tenant associations to build collective power, support each other through, and to allow them to support each other through the pandemic. 
and assisting tenants to receive rental assistance through special COVID rent relief programs and one-shot deals. It is more important than ever for us to maintain and strengthen the safety nets in our city, access to high quality free legal services, and I'm advocacy is a crucial part crucial part of this equation. Despite the tight budget season, we urge you to prioritize funding in the fiscal year 2020-22 budget so Brooklyn A has the necessary resources to respond to the growing critical need to keep New Yorkers safely in their homes. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we'll hear from Lyric Thompson, followed by Pablo Estupinian and Deborah Ack. Hello. I'm going to begin now. Hi, hi everyone. My name is Lyric Thompson and I'm just a citizen. I'm not here to ask you for money. I am here to tell you where you can save money and that's HPD. I'm in a 421A building that I'm sure, you know, Council Member Cornegie, you're very well aware that is not up to basic code nor was it ever properly registered with DHCR. So several things. One, when HPD revokes a 421A exemption or a J51 exemption, they leave millions of dollars in the hands of bad developers. Now, why they ask for just a small fraction of repayment, I, I, I don't know. I, I tend to believe that's like a little gift for committing a crime and that sends out the wrong message, especially during a time where we're having a housing crisis and the tenants you know, down here in the trenches were being preyed upon like an all you can eat buffet at Shoney. Now, the second area that we could save money is enforcement. The lack of enforcement with uh, HPD is systemic and it's disturbing. We have had over 300 inspections on our building, four and a half years of revolving violations on an entrance door that was never up to basic code, never up to basic code. It never should have been on the building. I can't help but think that at least one of those 300 people that walked through this building inspecting this door and the, the conditions in this building, that somebody would have picked up on that. The fact that they haven't, and six years later, I'm still going roundabout with HPD over a door that is not up to basic code, that I didn't come up with these codes, they're actually written down. They're safety codes for a reason. It's problematic and it's very disturbing. How much money do you think that's costing our city? How much money does it cost us when HPD inspectors lie about gaining access? And they do systemically. I mean, I could send you at least 10 different videos and or photo evidence that could demonstrate that HPD does not tell the truth when they come out here. That is costing us a lot of money. In 2018, the New York Times came out with a, a article, Mold Leaks in Rats, something to that Time effect. has expired. And they spoke about this exact issue. This city council has done nothing to address this issue. Why? What are you going to do about it, Council Member Cornegie? When are you going to call HPD into a hearing and ask them why they're not enforcing the basic, the basic safety codes that we have? Are we going to wait until someone dies to address this issue? Just for the record, everything you sent me, Lyric, we sent it directly to HPD. And so, no, I'm not going to wait till someone dies. We they do nothing. About that. They it's do great. absolutely nothing about it. And it's dangerous. And, and I don't, for my part, I don't understand. It's one thing to make a mistake. It's another thing to make a mistake and never address it and clarify it when it creates a hazardous situation for citizens in my city. What are we doing to address this? I'm gonna to continue to work to get you what you need, but now that you do have a, a council member who is very capable, I told you I'm gonna work with Dorma Diaz and continue to work with Dorma Diaz on your behalf with HPD to get you everything you need. It's not just my behalf, Robert. I, it's no, 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 I understand that. There's a building at 1660 and they wrote a B violation for bars on their window that if there's a fire, these people are gonna die. And they put it at the same hazard level as the gasketing on someone's refrigerator. May I make a suggestion for just one second? Um, because certainly these are issues throughout the city. Ms. Townsend, sounds like you've been through a lot. And Six years. It's really too much, no I question. Have you ever tried reaching out to the Office of the Tenant Advocate in the Department of Buildings? Yes. In fact, I, I will say this. When Our building was illegal by corrupt DOB inspectors. I'm sorry, when did you reach out to them? Um, actually, it was probably a couple years ago. 
Yeah, they and, didn't yeah. exist. And they then, didn't exist a couple of years ago. This is a I, brand new division in the Department of Buildings called the Office of the Tenant Advocate. Mm -hmm. I hear you're really exercised and I'm sure you wanna pursue this conversation. This is a public hearing. We have a lot of other people who wanna testify. And I think at this juncture, we should move on to the next person, but um, don't appreciate the snort after I've made a particularly good suggestion to you. Ma'am, I've which gone that route before. Just the giving the you the at the Department of Buildings. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Pablo Estupinian, followed by Deborah Ack and John Krinsky. The time will begin now. Good afternoon, Committee Chair Cornegie, um, Subcommittee Chair Rosenthal, and the other members of the community, of the committee. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, my name is Pablo Estupinian, and I'm the Director of Casa de Settlement in the Bronx. Um, CASA is a tenant organizing project of New Settlement in the Southwest Bronx that organizes tenant associations to win repairs, improve services and building conditions, um, and we hold landlords accountable. We also work on citywide and statewide campaigns to expand right to counsel, stop evictions, expand renter rights across the state when rent freezes from the RGB, um, and currently working uh, to cancel rent, um, which for the record includes tenants, homeowners, and prioritizing a landlord hardship fund. Um, for uh, affordable housing landlords and small landlords and not prioritizing corporate landlords for relief. Um, CASA is a part of New Settlement. We serve over 16,000 program participants in the community on a yearly basis. And we have 16 departments that provide services mostly uh, around educational after-school programs, as well as organizing arms around education and housing justice. Uh, today, I'm here on behalf of the Stabilizing New York City Initiative. Um, coalition, uh, which is comprised of 20 organizations who have come together to combat citywide tenant harassment and preserve affordable housing for New Yorkers who need it the most. Um, this coalition, Stabilizing, combines legal advocacy and direct action organizing um, in creating a citywide network to help tenants learn their rights, improve building conditions, uh, restore basic services through organizing and end harassment from predatory equity landlords. Um, we want to thank the council uh, and we're grateful for the funding we have received over the last six years and our partnership with HPD. Um, and I'm here to urge uh, the council uh, to restore our initiative funding back to the levels before the pandemic hit at a total of 3.1 million. Um, uh, we want to make sure that there's equity across the board and that the essential the time has expired that the essential community organizing work we do does continue. And I also just wanna, in my own personal capacity as director of CASA, also urge continued funding for the housing preservation initiative through HPD. Um, as you know, we have been doing organizing work that isn't always recognized and has let New York City um, allowed families to shelter in place. And we have only experienced uh, four families being evicted in the last year um, due to our critical organizing work. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Deborah Ack, followed by John Krinsky and Athena Bernkopf. Deborah. Your time will begin now. Good afternoon, Committee Chair Cornegy, Subcommittee Chair Rosenthal, and members of the committee and subcommittee. My name is Deborah, and I am the recording secretary on the East New York Community Land Trust. As my um, other committee members have told you, we are a grassroots volunteer and resident-led CLT fighting for community control of land so that what is built on the land meets the needs of low-income Black and Brown people forever. That includes residential, commercial, and green space. What does the East New York CLT mean to me? It has given my life purpose, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic. pandemic. With being on lockdown, it gives me a reason to keep moving and fighting for a change in East New York. I lived in East New York for approximately 18 years. I've raised two beautiful children here. I have seen the change in East New York and look forward to continuing change for my community by acquiring long-term land ownership and stewardship for us by us. 
This funding will give us the opportunity to do just that. Some of our accomplishments have been the writing of our bylaws through a collaborative democratic process. We have elected our first five board members, which I am a part of, and we are now officially incorporated as a non-for-profit organization. Through our community outreach, we have grown our steering committee to 25 plus active volunteer members who move our work forward in three committees that meet weekly over Zoom. All steering committee members are East New York and Brownsville residents. Through this pandemic, we have held 12 virtual community events and six in-person events to educate residents about the community land trust model and bring them explained. into the CLT movement. We have depended we have deepened our community relationships through food giveaways, lot cleanups, and a youth design competition. We need the city to invest in our CLT and in the citywide CLT movement. Please renew funding for the CLT initiative at 1.5 million. Thank you for the opportunity to address the council. Thank you for your testimony. We will now hear from John Krinsky, followed by Athena Burnkoff. Your time will begin now. John, you're still muted. Very Sorry. Um, John, I'm pretty, sure you said, I'm pretty sure you said something very profound, so you may want to start from the beginning. Good afternoon, uh, Committee Chair Carnegie. Uh, Subcommittee Chair Rosenthal, members of the committee and subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is John Krinsky. I'm a professor of political science and director of the Community Change Studies Program at the City College of New York and a founding board member of the New York City Community Land Initiative, or NICELY, on behalf of whom I'm testifying. NICELY has been working for the last eight and a half years to expand community land trust as a critical strategy for dealing with the city's deep affordability crisis in housing and for the need for greater community control over other land uses. Among NICELY's members are 15 CLTs, either active or in formation, and a number of other technical assistance providers. Many of these organizations, along with several others, are part of a citywide community land trust initiative that city council has funded before, for the last two years and uh, that is now seeking $1.51 million in discretionary funding in fiscal 22 to develop CLTs in permanently affordable housing, commercial and community spaces in all five boroughs of New York City. In the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, CLTs have an especially critical role to play to stabilize housing, combat speculation, and to ensure a just recovery in Black, Brown, and immigrant neighborhoods. So we ask the committee to recommend renewed funding for the CLT initiative in the fiscal 22 budget. You'll doubtless hear more about the important work that CLT, uh, the, the CLT initiative is doing today. I want to depart from my written testimony, uh, or what it will say, and to add just a bit of personal and historical perspective here. 25 years ago, as a 26-year-old urban planner, I led a 10-city study of CLTs and mutual housing associations as a research associate at the Community Service Society. The report we wrote called Balancing Act showed that these kinds of organizations succeeded most when they balanced resident organizing, development, and good management, and that this kind of balance both made for good stewardship and was a challenge requiring ongoing training. And education. Then in New York City, we went through 20 years of the Giuliani and Bloomberg administrations when the political decision, it was a political decision, was made to put the growing nonprofit sector that had been nourished as a way to bring back communities from the brink in the 1980s on a starvation diet. Now, several things happen in that circumstance. First, 25 years on a starvation diet means that necessarily you lose muscle. The city has pointed to the relative strength of for-profit developers of affordable housing, but this was something that the city itself engineered. And as with, and, and with as mixed results as the nonprofit sector provided with a declining share of the pie. Second, 25 years of a policy shift can make that common sense. Our spectacular, to failure, our spectacular failure to house people who are precariously housed in the city, a failure that keeps getting worse, 
suggests that this common sense is not good sense. And so I just wanted to say that one of the great things about being involved in this work now is that there's a new generation of organizers, largely in black, brown, and immigrant neighborhoods, who are maybe 10 years old or not even twinkles in their parents' eyes when Balancing Act is published, and who don't share this common sense. And the energy and understanding they bring to the work, the deep understanding of organizing, engagement, training, and what it means to foster long-term governance, is inspiring and absolutely informs the work that the CLTs are doing on the ground. And my small team from City College is helping to structure this process and developing the next generation of workshops, training, and popular education materials in collaboration with them. So renewed fiscal 2022 uh, funding is critical to maintaining this progress as more groups secure legal and technical assistance, launch CLT operations, sustain comprehensive organizing and community planning and acquire properties for long-term community stewardship. So I really urge you to keep up the funding, increase the funding and um, really help us work to turn the city around. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, we have a thank question you. from Chair Rosenthal. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Chair Carnegie, go, I'm after you. No, 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 I was saying thank you to John for his testimony. Oh, well, I was going to say thank you to John for his testimony. Um, but also, uh, can I ask you a question I've been sort of thinking about as we've been hearing um, organizers in the community land trust community, you know, talk about these just wonderful achievements and involvement. Um, and, and I probably should have asked the commissioner, but didn't. Um, what do you think? Why do you think the city, all the questions that Councilmember Cornegie and I were asking this morning about, come on, let's sort of speed up home ownership and let's, you know, what can we do at this moment? And why isn't there answer community land trust or is it, and I'm just missing something. And you might have to get unmuted again. I know, uh, they're working on it. There you go. No, I got it now. Uh why isn't the why isn't the uh, HPD's commissioners answer community land trusts? Or the I city. think it goes. Why doesn't the city just like say, yeah, this makes sense? Um, I you know, I wish you. I mean, other than other than a couple of things. Um, I mean, certainly it's true that over the last twenty five years, we have not or. I mean, certainly, and, and most most clearly during the Bloom, uh, the Giuliani and Bloomberg administrations, yeah, but yeah. even you know into the current one, um, you know we've directed so much more in terms of resources to for-profit developers um, through and mand you know first voluntary then mandatory inclusion zoning. Yeah, it exactly. hasn't been part of the strategy, so it becomes entrenched as common sense that this isn't how we do things, but it's also clear that it's not working. What's the uh, what's the um, the city on the city council side? I know in all our meetings, we're we're all on board, right? And we, you know, are um, adding funding all the time. I'm looking at Miss Act; she's amazing. Um, but I'm just uh, wondering if um, so. We've been funding things for the last bunch of years. Isn't that? Isn't that, doesn't that become a research paper that then gets submitted to the city and you can demonstrate outcomes and, you know, or, or does it just take more time and faith? Do you know what I mean? You know, I, I think, um, I mean, it, it's interesting, the idea of sort of doing a, a research paper and, you know, here, here you're talking to a professor at City College and maybe I should be hitting myself up over the head saying, you know, why haven't I done this? Um, and part of it is that I'm actually kind of on a daily basis, much more sort of in the trenches, helping to develop popular education materials. I mean, the, the sort of teaching side rather than the re research side. It's, it's okay, I'm rooting for you. No, 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 but, but, no, but you make- you make something a, to say too, but go ahead. But you make, a, you make an excellent point about, you know, at what point do we sort of aggregate this and say, um, this is, you know, this is what the success is. And part of it, part of it is, is that, you know, we've gotten, uh, you know, the CLTs take some time to get off the ground. They're getting off the ground. East Harlem, 
the East Harlem El Barrio CLT, which began as a pilot project for the New York City of the New York City Community Land Initiative, just it just acquired its first four properties uh, in East Harlem. I got you. Uh, Don't worry about it. That's all right. No, no, no. That. I get the point. I get the point. You know, my mom was an academic, and I'm much more of a you know, let's get it done. So I'm a little bit, I'm projecting just a little bit. So don't take this personally, John, at all. But what I'm wondering, I, I think the best, um, the best academic work is actually a roadmap. And, um, you know, I get all the history part of it, but it, and maybe Dave's going to answer this question, but just sort of, it strikes me that we're in a moment in time, especially with all these mayoral candidates, where you guys come up with a blueprint and say, who's on board? Who's added this to their platform? I challenge you to do that because it feels like a not, as, as new as it is, and I really, really get that, don't, you know, I've, I get it, um, but there could be, you know, maybe it's not statistically perfect, but it, it strikes me there could be, you know, the bones of something that would be incredibly powerful right now. Look, maybe it's already out there and I'm just ignorant and don't know about it because I'm busy just like you are, John, every single day with the fires that I'm putting out. But, um, you know, could I ask um, to the committee council, would it be possible to unmute day Del Rio, and because I think she she wants to say something, unless I'm wrong, at which point she won't unmute herself. There she goes. Yeah, just quickly that. Um, <laughs> thank you for that question. And you know, it's a you know we're really a year and a half into the CLT discretionary funding initiative, so it is very I early. See. I um, see. And um, but there has been that said tremendous progress made. So we we definitely will be um, organizing a briefing for council and providing a report that details some of the accomplishments that you've heard so far. And I know Athena is speaking next, I believe, about East Harlem. So, you know, there's a lot to say about specific acquisitions and that level of growth, but there's a lot to say that's more nuanced about all the kind of legwork that goes into creating these sure. new institutions. And we're excited to do that with you all. Um, I just wanted to also mention a lot of the groups that um, are funded through this initiative went through a two-year learning exchange together oh, at yeah. um, New Economy Project and nicely collectively organized and presented. So all these groups did a deep two-year dive um, into CLT history and impact. And so we do, we have done a lot of learning about what has happened around the country, what are the challenges, where has it worked well, and what is needed to reach scale and city support. And that was to John's point that everything was sort of held in abeyance during Giuliani and Bloomberg. So, you know, yeah. you're sort of getting back on your feet again. I totally get that. Yeah. You know, I go to probably, I watch on Zoom probably a mayoral forum every single night. And I know these people are being tortured, but it does strike me, you you could have a great forum. I don't know if you're already planning You'll that. We'll be seeing some briefings coming up on um, the lean sale abolition and how CLTs can play a role in replacing that system. And then also more broadly about social housing and the role of land trust and community ownership. Absolutely. You do, right. You should do a mayoral forum and see where these candidates are, um, you know, before or after you send out your briefing, but hold their feet to the fire because I think what you're doing um, must be continued. And of course, the city council is trying to be as helpful as we can. And, you know, we, you know, everyone's budget gets clipped, but everyone's trying really hard. Um, but you need to go to scale. I mean, you need, you need more. Um, I agree. It would be, I think the next place to go is to get the city to engage the city agencies, right? The mayoral side. All right. Thank you very much. Thank I'm you. just thanks so much. Traveling. Thank you. All right. Next, last but not least, we'll be hearing from Athena Bernkopf. Your time will begin now. Uh, good afternoon, Committee Chair Cornegie, Subcommittee Chair Rosenthal, and members of the committee and subcommittee. And thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Athena Bernkopf. I'm the project coordinator of the East Harlem Barrio Community Land Trust. We are a member of the New York City Community Land Initiative, and we are one of the 17 organizations uh, that are part of the Citywide Community Land Trust Initiative. Um, uh, and I'm here to ask you to uh, recommend that the CLT initiative be included in this year's budget. 
Um, the East Harlem Barrio CLT works to develop and preserve community controlled, truly and permanently affordable housing, commercial, green and cultural spaces in East Harlem and Barrio and the surrounding area that prioritizes households of extremely low to low incomes. As a strategy to ensure permanent affordability, the East Harlem and Barrio Community Land Trust will own land and lease it to buildings on that land, as well as having developed a resident controlled mutual housing association. In the past year, we have closed on the first four properties to enter onto the CLT, including four residential buildings that will be owned by a newly formed East Harlem and Barrio Mutual Housing Association. On these properties, beyond just the commercial, the residential buildings, we also have two commercial spaces and one community space. Um, we, in closing on the transfer, we are working with a, a nonprofit partner um, developer uh, who's working to get these buildings <sighs> repairs that have been needed in some cases uh, for over a decade. Uh, we've also been able to establish the long-term security and stability of the property and the rents in the building through the 99-year ground lease between the CLT and the MHA. Uh, we continue to deepen the resident engagement and leadership development um, of the buildings through the rehabilitation process, through trainings which are seeking to prepare residents to step into leadership of the MHA, both through um, uh, developing their capacity to make decisions around the operations and building and management of the buildings, in addition to uh, participating in local community processes that affect the well being of the buildings, um, the, the land, and the people who live in them. Um, we believe this crucial this work is crucial to cultivating strong, resilient, and healthy neighborhoods that can care for its community members and bring needed to support needed support to the black and brown working class communities that are most vulnerable to the devastation of the city's housing crisis, not to mention the pandemic. With ongoing funding, the CLTs that are growing in strength throughout the city can continue to do this crucial work of ensuring that land and buildings are put to the most critical community needs. And we are seeking also to create pathways for community visioning and planning processes that are building out communities that are not just healthy, but thriving. Um, and we hope that you will continue to support this work uh, into the future as we build out long-term um, sustainable structures. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes our public testimony. If we inadvertently missed anyone who registered to testify today, if they can use the Zoom raise hand function, we'll call on them now. All right, seeing none, we'll pass this back to Chair Cornegie to close the hearing. So I, I wanna say it's always a, a pleasure to hear from the voices that are on the ground. Your testimonies are important. It runs very late sometimes into the evening, but it's well worth it to hear the importance of uh, what you believe and us here at the council actually attempting to enact um, from hearing your voices. So I, I wanna thank you on behalf of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. Um, and I'll just let my, um, my, my colleague and co-chair, uh, Council Member Rosenthal also close us out. Is that, is that it? We're going with the hot signal? Okay. All right, that's cool. I, I, that would have been way cool if I would have done that. I guess I, next time I'll do that. Thank you all for attending this.